watching from home, you're very welcome. Uh, we're delighted to be back here in this beautiful surroundings. And thanks to Scott and all the team here at the Filson for having us back. Um, my name is Gillian Hunt, and I am the research officer with the Ulster Historical Foundation. We are a not-for-profit educational charity um, based in the north of Ireland that exists to help people find out more about their Irish and Scots-Irish ancestors. And I'm joined here today um, by our executive director, Fintan Mullen, and we'll be co-presenting this workshop this morning. Now, before we get started, I just wanted to highlight a few books to you um, that we would particularly recommend. Um, those of you in the room, we have a, a book table with us, which will be available in the breaks and at the end. Um, and for those of you at home, um, we have an online bookstore. I'll show you that in a few slides time. So these are the ones that we would particularly recommend. Uh, the one on the left is Researching Scots-Irish Ancestors. Uh, this is by our research director, Dr. William Roston, and it focuses on the period between 1600 and 1800 um, for the nine counties in the province of Ulster. So if your ancestors emigrated before 1800 or you have already researched your family back before 1800, make sure you don't leave today without a copy of that book under your arm. The one in the middle, Tracing Your Irish Ancestors, is by John Grenham. And John is a well-known genealogist in Ireland. This is book's now in its fifth edition. And many people would consider this to be the genealogist's Bible. It's a great introduction to genealogy. And the one on the right, Chris Patton, is a well-known genealogist. He's based in Scotland, but he's from Ireland. And his book, Tracing Your Irish Family History on the Internet, um, focuses on some smaller websites um, that maybe cover just a small geographical area or one particular source that some of the bigger guides aren't going to necessarily cover. So all three of these books complement each other. They do not cover the same ground. We also have a series of books by Ian Maxwell, Tracing Your Scottish Ancestors, Tracing Your Northern Irish Ancestors, and then the one on the left, Your Irish Ancestors. Now, it has a small research guide at the back, but it's very much more a book about the context of our ancestors' lives in Ireland in the 19th century, talking about life in the town, life in the countryside, religion, education, the workhouse system. So it's a really good book just to understand more about what life was like in Ireland in that period. We also have a number of the county guides, the flyleaf books um, with us today. Um, and lots more that I'm not going to talk about um, at this uh, introductory session. We'll talk about some books during the pre other presentations. Now, for those of you at home, our online bookstore is booksisland.org.uk, and the 74-page the handout you were emailed will have that website address on it. Now, Irish genealogy and Scots-Irish genealogy, it's a really good news story at the minute. There's lots more records being added online, lots more resource, resources being made available to you than would have been available to you 5, 10, 15 years ago. Sometimes there's so much going online that it can be hard to kind of keep on top of. So I wanted to highlight just a couple of blogs, uh, a couple of news pages that we find really helpful. The first one is called irishgenealogynews.com, and this is a collated by Claire Santry. She posts a couple of times a week, usually, with new sources going online, new publications, um, information about archives, um, information about Irish genealogy events being held across the world. So that's a good website to keep an eye on. And then we also have the Scottish Genes blog um, by Chris Patton. Um, now, despite the name, this will cover Scottish and Irish genealogy. Um, and that's another great blog to keep an eye on. Um, would it be possible to get the lights down at the front of the room, if that's if that's possible? Now, before we start digging into the records available in um, in Ireland, which is what we're here to do this morning, one thing we would just emphasise is to make sure that you've looked at all the sources possible over here in the United States. Make sure you've looked at things like naturalization papers, cemetery and burial records, passenger lists, immigration records, printed obituaries, passport records, church records, and the, the information within your own family papers. 
not only do we suggest you do that for your direct descent, your direct ancestor, but if they have any siblings or cousins in the family, make sure you've explored all of those. I was working for a client recently and um, I found their direct ancestor in some of the US census. But unfortunately, as was common, they just wrote that they had come from Ireland. They were born in Ireland. Very frustrating. I'm sure some of you have encountered that. Um, but in one of the senses, I noticed that his younger brother was living with him at that time. Um, so after the direct ancestor died, I spent some time researching the younger brother and he had survived to appear in one more US census. And in that census, he wrote the county that they came from. So exploring all the members of the family can be really profitable for you. And for example, just you can see in some of these gravestones, the actual place of birth is recorded on the gravestone. So that can be a clue. A few tips for Irish family history. Um, and we'll see some examples of this in the presentations Fintan and I will be giving this morning. Do consider that there could be mistakes made either in the original record or in the transcription. If everything else looks right, then don't disregard that record. That's particularly true of ages. Quite commonly when I'm doing research for clients, the age on their marriage record and the age on their death record and the age on the census are not the same. So people in that period, it's very hard for us to imagine, but they didn't know what age they were. So there, it is a guess. So it, that's why you'll see slightly different ages in all of those sources. Now, don't overlook using sources that post-date your ancestors leaving Ireland. They can still be useful. That may be because siblings or cousins remained in Ireland, and it's those, those individuals or their descendants that you're picking up in the records. Or it may be that some of those sources that post-date your ancestors' immigration refer to earlier documents that may include your ancestors. Do look for ancestors in the background noise of documents because they may appear not as the main reason for a document being created, but they may still appear within it. So, for example, um, they may not have married in Ireland, but you may find that they were a witness to a marriage in Ireland or within a estate, a, a, a lease document. They may, may not have had, made a lease themselves with a the landlord. They maybe were, were younger when they went to America, but they may have appeared as a life on, listed within a lease document. It, similar to what I was saying about using those records that post date your ancestors' immigration, if you don't know exactly where your family came from in Ireland, do use all digitized sources as a means for searching the prevalence and occurrence of your ancestor's surname. And we'll see more about that in just a moment. And very important point, keep a really open mind on the surname and place name spellings. Do remember that spelling wasn't standardized to um, well into the 1800s. And many of our ancestors were either illiterate or not fully literate. So they were reliant on how the clergyman or the government official wrote down their surname. And particularly if they couldn't read, they had no way to check that it was being spelt the right way. So sometimes I work with people and they say, oh, my ancestor's surname was green, but our branch always spell it with an E on the end. And then they won't look at any records that don't have that E on the end and they're, they're missing out relevant records. So that's true both of surnames and of place names. Now, the Public Record Office of Ireland was built in Dublin in 1867. Um, it was a beautiful building. This is the reading room at the front and the record treasury at the back with those lovely arched windows. And this little section here was, a, was actually a, a little bridge between them. And that acted as a fire break in case a fire broke out in the reading room where you could smoke, where there was gaslight. The record treasury was just... Um, lit by natural light. They had a beautiful skylight. Now, in June 1922, the Battle of Dublin was the start of the Irish Civil War. In April, the anti-treaty forces had taken over the complex that housed the Public Record Office, and then the pro-treatyists attacked the complex in June. Unfortunately, the anti-treatists were using these buildings to store their ammunition and their explosives. So when the pro-treatists attacked, the explosions, the fire that came out of that was absolutely massive. This is just an image of 
from taken from that day. And we lost an awful lot of records um, from the public record office. And you can see why this is the record treasury with those beautiful arch windows. You can see it was completely destroyed. Um, now, I realize I'm starting the workshop slightly <laughs> depressing, <laughs> um, but it is important for you to be aware of this fire because we lost such a lot of documents. Now, Fintan and I will be spending the rest of the workshop talking about you know, the sources that we do have, of which they are many, but it is important you're aware of this. So, for example, we lost the vast majority of our 1821 to 1851 census returns, or 1861 to 91 were also destroyed at a different time. So that means that the earliest complete census that we have is 1901. Um, and so that's important because for those of you who have maybe been researching ancestors in other countries, the census returns are a really helpful way to do genealogy. And we don't really have those for Ireland in the 19th century. We also lost 60% of our Church of Ireland parish records and we lost our pre-1900 wills. Now, sometimes um, when you dig into this, it isn't just as awful as this slide might suggest. So, for example, the Church of Ireland is the Anglican Church in Ireland, the Episcopalian Church. It was the state church in Ireland up to 1870. So for that reason, its earlier records were considered to be public records and they were in the public record office. But that does not apply to any other denomination whose records even to this day are private. So records from Quakers, Methodists, Presbyterian, Catholic, they were not in the public record office. They were unaffected by the fire. It is just the Church of Ireland records. And even with the pre-1900 wills, from 1858, we were keeping copies of those wills. So although the originals were indeed destroyed, we have copies word for word that are available elsewhere. And an interesting project that's come out of this, um, there were a couple of historians a few years ago who wondered whether they could create a kind of virtual 3D record treasury. Um, and they've spent the last few years working on this Working on records that are in Trinity College Dublin, the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland, uh, National Archives in Kew in London, and archives and libraries across the world. And they've been trying to see if any of those organizations hold copies or extracts or indexes to records that had been in the Public Record Office before the fire. Now, we're not going to completely be able to repopulate it. You know, we're not going to suddenly find the whole census hiding somewhere. But it's really useful to have these centralized because in some cases, there's maybe just one document held in a very small library or archive somewhere across the world that you would never think in your own research to visit or to access. And now that it's being centralized on this website, it's going to be really useful for us. So do revisit, do visit that website and revisit it. Um, the government has given them more funding to actually continue this project because it's been it's been um it's been done so well. Now, I did mention those surnames, and again, just to dig into that a little bit deeper, there are the many surnames that can be several different ways to spell them, and sometimes that changes over time. Sometimes some of the spelling quite can depend on the area in Ireland. Uh, so Finton's surname is Mullen, and he spells it A-N, uh, but when you go back to Tyrone, where his family came from, it's often spelled I-N. Sometimes there's a prefix, sometimes there's not. Um, and even surnames that kind of feel quite standard, like Hamilton and Montgomery don't particularly look like they could, they don't feel like they should be spelt many different ways. When you get back in this example in the early 1600s, you can see that they are indeed spelt many different ways. So always think of phonetically, how could your surname be spelt um, if someone was writing it who just had never seen it before? Now, a few books that we would recommend, uh, Family Names from the Glens of Antrim. We published that last year. Uh, Surnames of Scotland by George Black. Irish Names and Surnames by Wolf. Um, we, uh, we brought that back into print a few years ago. We have some copies of the Wolf uh, publication with us today. And these are the two ones we would also particularly recommend. Edward McLeisett was the Chief Herald of Ireland and his uh, classic surname of Ireland is an excellent book. And we also have Robert Bell's Book of Ulster Surnames. Um, Robert's book was out of print for a long time, and we actually brought it back into print in 20, 
21. And we have copies of both of those books on our website and also on our book table. If you would like to browse them, we have two cop reference copies that I'll maybe set in the front row. So during the breaks, if you want to look at them, please use the reference copies rather than the ones that are for sale on the table. Just to give you an example of those spellings, um, these are two letters um, from Cotton Matha in 1718, writing about the well-known Scots-Irishman James McGregor. And in these two letters, he actually spells James McGregor's surname three different ways in two letters. And I have seen that, you know, you can kind of understand that maybe two clergymen in a church would spell a family surname differently. But I've actually seen the same minister spell the, na the family name different ways as he baptizes different children. So that's what I mean about the surname spelling wasn't standardized. Now, the surname itself can be a clue in some cases because some surnames in Ireland are quite geographically specific. You're only going to find them in particular counties or even within a county in a particular area. This is a really good website, johngrenham.com. He's actually mapped a lot of surnames using, for example, um, Griffiths Valuation, birth records, the census, and Catholic baptisms. And that's what I mean by using records that post-date your ancestors' immigration, because those sources that John has used to map this may be much later than when your ancestors left Ireland. But actually... People, you know, they don't move a, a huge amount in Ireland. So actually, where this, for, this, for example, this slide is the surname of Sugru, and you can see it's down there in County Kerry. Even if you had Sugru ancestors who left in the 1700s, this can still be a clue that County Kerry is the word to focus your research. Um, so that's what I mean by these later records can still be used as signposting websites to help you begin to focus your research and similarly with John, this is Griffith's valuation from the mid 1800s. And you can see the same little pocket of Sugru's down there in the southwest of Ireland. Now, like I say, this only works for some surnames. There are so only some surnames are site specific. If you choose, for example, Murphy, this is what you get. <laughs> Not as useful. <laughs> Now, in genealogy, I always talk about the three C's of genealogy, which are census returns, civil records, those are your vital records, your birth, marriage, and death certificates, and church records. I'm going to be talking about church records with you in the next presentation, um, but I just want to look at those other two C's with you this morning. So we've already mentioned that we lost the vast majority of our 1821 to 1851 census. There are a few fragments, but they're quite small. And I'll show you where those are in just a few slides. We also lost our 1861 to 91 um, in the end of the 19th century, start of the 20th century. So we don't have any records for those four census, which does mean that our 1901 and 1911 census are the earliest complete census we have. And that makes them really valuable to us. As you get into the 20th century, the story unfortunately doesn't get any better. 1921, we were in the middle of a civil war, so no census was taken. So they took an interim census, both in Northern Ireland and what is now the Republic of Ireland in 1926. And um, the Republic of Ireland census, 1926 census, should be released in a few years. In Britain and Ireland, we have a hundred year closure on our census. Uh, but unfortunately, the 1926 census was destroyed in Northern Ireland, they believe, during the Second World War. So the next one for Northern Ireland is 1937. So we have a good few years to wait for that. However, if any of you are looking for, for ancestors from the mid 20th century, we do have in Northern Ireland the 1939 National Register. Now, this was a register created at the outbreak of the Second World War in September 1939, and it led to ration books and ID cards, and it was taken in England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. The Republic of Ireland was neutral in the Second World War, so they don't have this source. Um, England and Wales, this register is now available on Find My Past. In Northern Ireland, you can access it through the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland. You have to put in, you have to submit an inquiry and you have to provide a street or townland address and they will provide this for you. The great thing about it is it has the date of birth. Um, and actually, rather surprisingly, 
20th century ancestors can be more challenging because a lot of our websites, a lot of our online sources have a cutoff date of 100 years. So there isn't as much available online for people who were born less than 100 years ago. So this source can be really important. Now, how can we access the 1901-1911 census? This is a free website, census.nationalarchives.ie. It contains those two census as well as those census fragments from 1821 to 1851. Now, it's very straightforward to use. Uh, you can put in the name and you can put in the address if you know it, the age. There are more search options there for occupation or religion. And because it's free, you can really play around with it. On occasion, if someone has a surname that can be spelt many, many different ways, I have been able to search even without the surname and just putting in their age and their occupation and their first name. So because it's free, it's really user friendly. And it's great that it's not one of those websites that insists on you in putting in a surname to be able to use it. You then can see a scan of the actual document. Um, and this is sheet A, and this is the one filled out by the head of household if they were literate, and then they signed their name at the bottom right there. If they weren't literate or not fully literate, the uh, census enumerator, who was usually a local policeman, um, would have filled it out for them, and then the head of household made their mark in the bottom right. Um, now, the census is one of my favorite sources. I've looked at thousands and thousands of them. Um, and out of that, this remains the my, my most favorite one. Um, so those of you who haven't looked at it before, it is a snapshot of everyone in the house on the night of the census. So as well as family, it will include visitors, lodgers, servants, boarders. Um, we have the first name and the surname. We have relationship to the head of the, fa of the family which is very useful. We have the religious profession. That was the denomination they belong to. And that is really useful because you may not know exactly what church they attended back in Ireland. They maybe joined a different church once they came over here because the church back home wasn't available locally. Um, and that's another reason why I recommend that you look at sources that post-date your ancestors' immigration. I was working for a client recently from Australia and her ancestor was Catholic and left Ireland in the late 1800s. Um, but I decided to look at the 1901 census to try and get a sense of maybe where the surname was found in Ireland. And when I did that, I discovered that every single person of the ancestor's surname in Ireland in 1901 was Protestant. So when I wrote back to her, I said, I think we need to be quite broad minded about the church records that we're going to look at for you because there's a chance that maybe they were Protestant. So she went away did some more digging in Australia and discovered that he had actually converted and became a Catholic when he was in Australia and he actually had been baptized a Protestant. So that's what I mean, even if 1901 is much too late for you, because you can put it in a surname and see what religion it is, that can be really useful. Now, some surnames will be found in every church, but there are some surnames that may be more strongly associated with one particular denomination than the other. And that's why the 1901 census can still be of use to you. So in this case, James is actually Roman Catholic and his wife, Sarah, is Irish Church. Now, Irish Church actually meant Church of Ireland, the Anglican Church. You would think if you saw a Church of um, Irish Church that it would be Catholic, but it isn't. So that, again, just be mindful of that. And what they did, and a lot of people... Um, did this who were mixed marriage between a Catholic and a Protestant was all the boys went to church with the dad and all the girls went to church with the mum. I think a really sensible compromise. We have their education, which simply meant whether they could read and write, could not read, read only. Their age, and remember, as I mentioned earlier, ages can be quite inaccurate, particularly on a census. Anyone over the age of 37 in Ireland in 1901 did not have a birth certificate and they just simply did not know what age they were. Then we have their occupation, whether they were married, single or widowed, the county or city they were born in, and that can be a very helpful clue, whether they could speak or understand Irish and whether they had a disability. Now you can see James is a shoemaker, his wife Sarah is a dressmaker, the eldest children have started work, the middle, the middle children in the family are, are at school, but William, he's the youngest boy, he is six years old, but according to his father, William at six already has an occupation. And if you can just about make it out there, William's occupation is he torments the house. <laughs> now, any of you who know any six-year-olds will know exactly 
what that meant. But imagine if William was one of your relatives. How wonderful to find out what he was like as a six-year-old. But not only that, we get a glimpse into James. James has a good sense of humour. This is an official government record, and James is unafraid to write this down. You can see there's a little line drawn through it, so I don't know if that was... That was uh, Sergeant King or maybe James's wife that made him score it out. But luckily for us, uh, we can still read it um, and have a good laugh 120 years later. Now, the 1911 census is laid out exactly the same, but it has three additional columns. The number of years married, the wife is married in this current marriage, the number of children born alive in the current marriage, and the number of children still living. So that's really useful because it allows you to begin to identify the, the rough date of marriage. And maybe some children have died in infancy that you didn't know of, or maybe some children are are older and have set up their own household. So that's very those columns are really valuable. This is G Thomas Kelly. He lives in Dublin um, with his wife, Margaret, and young daughter, Kathleen. They've been married for three years. I'm not sure how long they stayed married if, if uh, Margaret saw the census return because Thomas wrote under Margaret's call line that she had a disability and her disability was that she had a loose tongue. <laughs> Again, as well as all the wonderful genealogical information we can get from the census, occasionally we get a real glimpse into what was going on in that family at that time. Now, as well as the actual householders' pages, we also have information about the houses. So we can find out, for example, what the walls were made of, what the roof was made of, how many rooms there were, how many windows at the front of the house, how many outbuildings. So that really builds up a picture of our ancestors' houses at that time. And do remember, even if your ancestor had emigrated before this time, it might still be the same family home that they grew up in. As well as the, the number of outbuildings, we also have the type of outbuildings listed here. Um, and that gives you an idea of the size of the farm, and the kind of farming they were doing in 1901, 1911. And I mentioned that this website also contains those census fragments. Um, and some of these fragments are really quite small. So for example, if you look at 1841, there is one parish in the whole of Ireland where the census survived. That's for the parish of Kilishandra in County Cavan. Just an example of sort of what we lost. This is the 1851 census, which survives for some parts of County Antrim and a few other places. And you can see it's laid out very similar to what we have seen with the 1901-1911 census, although they didn't record the religious denomination at that time. It also listed members of the family who were absent on the night of the census, which would be really valuable. Mostly they were just living somewhere else for work purposes and also members of the family who had died between 1841 and 1851. And imagine if we had that for the whole of Ireland for covering the Great Famine period, it would be a wonderful resource. So those are the census records. And just to finish off before Finton comes to talk, uh, those civil records, those are your birth, marriage, and death certificates. These are the key dates. All births, marriages, and deaths were registered in Ireland from the 1st of January, 1864 and non-Catholic marriages were registered from the 1st of April, 1845. So those are marriages that took place in a Protestant church, Jewish marriages, and marriages that took place in a registry office. And often in this period, a registry office marriage could well suggest a mixed marriage between a Protestant and a Catholic because it meant they didn't need to, to fight over what church they were going to get married in. Now, there are a few gaps, particularly births in the you know the early period in 1864 or 1867 or 8 because it took some families a little while to get used to having to tell the government when they had had a child so there are a few little gaps there but it mostly in most cases you should be able to get your family back to 1864 with birth and death records and marriage records if they married now because this is such a key source there's lots of organizations lots of websites that have put these records online. So Family Search, for example, has a great index to civil records on its site. But a few years ago, the Irish government made this website available for free, and it has really transformed how we do research within the civil registration period because it is free. So before this point, it took it cost a few dollars to look up a record. But if you maybe don't have a lot of information and you're kind of maybe making a stab in the dark, you might need to look up lots of records before you find the right one. And suddenly that becomes quite expensive because this is free. It means you can play with it. So if you see a record, it's the right area. The surnames could maybe be 
if you'd never seen the surname the right thing, but you maybe wouldn't have paid to look it up because it's quite out there in terms of spelling. Now you can just click on it, read it. It might be the right person. Or if the age is really off, you can still look at it and just check that it's not a transcription or that somebody hasn't read 72 as 12, that kind of thing. You can just get over brick walls that you might have had with your research. So it's a wonderful resource. These are the records that it has. Um, the cutoff dates for birth, marriages and deaths are similar to a lot of other organisations, such as the General Registry Office of Northern Ireland, Scotland's People. So they have births over 100 years, marriages over 75 years and deaths over 50 years. Now, we can understand the births and marriages as people are living longer. You know, there's a good chance that somebody who's 99 could still be alive. Someone who's married for 74 years could still be alive. And it's for their privacy that their, their records are not made available publicly. The 50-year cutoff date for deaths, I find a bit harder to understand because they are dead. I feel like they could have shortened that a bit. But anyway, this is what we have. We have all births from 1864 up to 1921, marriages from 1845 to 1946, and deaths from 1871 to 1971. Now you can see they only have up to 1921 for Northern Ireland. That's because this website is by the Irish government. So they only have access to records for Northern Ireland up to the time of partition. After that, the records apply just to the Republic of Ireland. And you can see we're, we're impatiently waiting for seven years of historic deaths to be added. Uh, now that we're so spiked by having all these deaths, when you find a reference to a death in 1869, you're really annoyed because you can't see the full record. Um, very straightforward. Again, you can put in the name. If you know the district, you can put that in. You can um, narrow it down by year. You can narrow it down by birth, marriage or death. But again, it's free. So you could put in just a surname and just see again, like the census, does my surname seem to occur in particular parts of Ireland? You then get a little index result and you can click on each of those and you can see you can narrow it down by district there as well on the left. And you get this lovely scan of the whole page. It's part of the reason why they um, were able to do it so quickly. And this is really helpful, actually having the whole page, because it may be that there were twins born in your family, but one of them didn't survive. And you, maybe that hasn't come down through the family. And then you see both ch children's births on the same page. Or, for example, as in this case, um, a mother died um, because of childbirth. She also had TB. And then her child was born prematurely and he also died. So the father, the husband actually went and registered the death of both his son and his wife who died six days apart. So it may be that you knew about the wife's death, but you didn't know about this baby. And because they're registered on the same page, you can pick that up. And then just to finish off, if you're looking after 1921 for Northern Ireland, the public, the General Registry Office of Northern Ireland has those records available online. Um, it is a credit-based system, so you do need to buy credits to be able to access those records. So I'm going to leave that now. That's part one of the introduction, and Fintan is going to come and cover part two with you, and then we're going to take a short break. Thank you all very much. Right. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see everybody. It's such a large crowd out on a Monday morning, a chilly Monday morning. Uh, we're delighted to see you. Welcome to everybody who's joining us uh, from home via Zoom. Uh, thank you all for taking part in the program. Could I just reiterate what uh, Gillian said? We'd like to thank Scott and the whole team here at uh, the Felson Historical Society for inviting us back to this wonderful institution. We really enjoy visiting um, and especially speaking in a beautiful uh, uh, environment like this. So I'm going to do the second part of this introduction this morning and in this part I'm going to be looking at the importance of our land divisions for your Irish research okay this is really quite a sort of elementary but fundamental as well uh, aspect of re aspect of research is getting to grips and understand the land divisions in Ireland how the land was broken down historically because that is how the information was gathered about your ancestors so the farm he was living on would be in a townland, um, and he would have a lease from his uh, the estate owner, and it would give the townland name on his lease, and that would be within a parish, which would be in a barony, which would be in a county. These four historic land divisions we're going to talk to you this morning. Ditto, Church of Ireland, or sorry, a church minister or priest 
we'll be recording information about our ancestors and often we'll be using the townland as the address where your ancestor lived. And government used these land divisions as well. So we have these divisions used for 400 years and more in record keeping in Ireland. So it's how the detail was gathered about our ancestors. And then that's how the material is often organised in the archives in Belfast or Dublin if you were to go and visit to undertake research. And the Irish are very good about leaving very strong clues as to where they come from. Um, they, perhaps more than any other European group, you'll see all European groups do this in the cemeteries here in North America, that they will often say the place in the country of origin they come from. But the Irish seem to do it almost better than any other migrant group. And some of you may be fortunate enough, if you go and look, uh, that a headstone here, a tombstone here in America, could well have an Irish place written on it. That's certainly the evidence we have found over the years. And sometimes it may have that key piece of information, gold dust, the townland, the smallest official unit. That's why it's so important. So we're just going to look at a couple of these here. Up here in the corner, we have Jane McKay Alexander, born in Red Hall, Ballycarry, Ireland. Well, Red Hall is the townland, that smallest little unit, about two or 300 acres in size. That's what we're talking about here. Maybe a bit bigger sometimes, maybe a lot smaller on other occasions. Red Hall, Ballycarry. Ballycarry is the parish that she is from. So there's the two most important land divisions written on her headstone in Ireland. Armed with that information, very quickly we would be able to go and find her in a land source that we use for the middle of the 19th century called Griffith's Valuation. Uh, very easily to find it based on that information and probably would find her father listed as the occupier of that place of ground in Red Hall and Ballycarry. Sometimes they don't give a specific townland name. So here we have in this rather impressive stone, John Biggs, 1763, was born in the county of Antrim in the Kingdom of Ireland. This one here is an interesting one. And here's a challenge to you. This is the oldest headstone we know of in the USA with an Irish place name written on it. So can you beat this? This is the challenge I'm throwing down to you this morning. Um, here lies the body of Major Thomas Jones, who came from Straban in the Kingdom of Ireland, settled and died here December 1713. So a specific location in Ireland written on a headstone that's 310 years old. And last, and this is where it really gets interesting, gold dust itself. This is in actually Natchez, Mississippi, a big burial ground. It's called the Catholic Burial Plot, this section, where years ago, maybe 15 years ago, we were there and counted a good hundred headstones uh, with Irish places on them, maybe 32 or 16 of the 32 counties of Ireland listed. And there we have here Peter Boyle, born in County Donegal in the townland of Corgarry, Ireland. So that vital piece of information, X really does mark the spot in that particular instance. Now, in terms of understanding our land divisions, you are very well set because there's so much online material and resources available to you that you can use. So you can do so much of this preparation work from home at the comfort of your own computer screen. I'm going to just run through several of them that are the most commonly used and the most useful. The first one is called Loganium, which is just the Irish word for place name. Um, and it's from the Ordnance Survey of Ireland, so the, uh, the organization that maps the country. And of course, it's all digital mapping these days. So we have this Loganium website, very good for the 26 counties of the Irish Republic, but of course it does cover the whole 32 counties. And it's a sort of website you would go if you're trying to find the place your ancestor came from, which is obviously one of the key objectives in your Irish research, especially when you're starting off. So say you're trying to find out more or understand what is the spelling of this place or have I found the right townland or place for my ancestor? You can do it in Irish or English. Once you insert whatever place you're looking for, if you get a return, it will tell you what it is. It's a townland here. It will give you the Gaelic spelling of it. It will give you the English translation of it. What it means in the Irish, or what the Irish means in English, I should say, it'll show you on a map exactly where it is, so you'll be able to zoom right in up close to see it. Um, it will also give detail about 
where that place is found in the historic record. And that is really important because the spelling of our townland names, Gillian mentioned about how our surnames, there is no standardization of spelling. That is equally the case for place names. So in the 17th and 18th and into the 19th century, you will see the place name of your ancestors spelt many different ways. And it just like, as we say with town uh, uh, surnames, don't fixate on the spelling of your name. Don't worry about it. If it looks like it, it probably is it because there's some, so much variation. Because a point to remember, so many of our townland names come from the Irish. Remember, they were translated from the original Irish. And in the Gaelic, it meant something. It just sounds like a silly word now, you know, Tober Curry or something like that. Uh, but it actually meant something in the Gaelic, usually a description of the landscape the top topographical feature, or it might be to do with an event that happened there. It could be some really absurd event, like a cow kicking over a milk a bucket with its uh, back leg, and that's how the place got its name. Or it could, crucially, have a personal name element in it as well. So it will give you, in this sort of website, where we see that place name in the historical record going back maybe two, three, four hundred years. It also, if you're interested, in some cases, will give you a little audio file telling you how to pronounce the Irish place name, which you may find interesting and useful because, as you're probably aware, the Gaelic language is nothing like the English language when it comes to pronunciation. It's very, very different. That's the website for the whole island, but particularly good for the 26 counties of what is now the Irish Republic. For the six counties of what is now Northern Ireland, we have this other really good website, placenamesni.org, where you can basically do exactly the same thing. You put in a place name, you will get results back. It will tell you if it's a minor place name, if it is a townland or a parish name. It will describe that for you historically, where that name originates, what it meant in the Irish, and how far back it can be found in the historical record. And I mentioned how these land divisions are really useful for going back about 400 years. But in terms of the origins of some of our Irish place names, some of our townland names are pre-Patrick in origin. That's come back more than 1,500 years. Uh, some of them, if not that far back, they may be 1,200 years old, around 800 AD. That's how old some of them actually are. Now, that is not to mean that the boundaries of these townlands have stayed the same for 1,500 years or 1,000 years. Of course, they have not. They've been modified and changed over time. But some of our place names have that antiquity. And when you're understanding that, researching that, tapping into that, you're tapping into such a rich heritage for the island and for your ancestors because this is the world your ancestor left behind after they came to America. At the opposite end of the scale in terms of, uh, uh, I suppose, complexity is this wonderful little website, townlands.ie. And it's simplicity itself. Everything is just organized alphabetically. So you can drill down by the county. And then if you went into, say, the parish, then the townlands within a parish and all the townlands are listed alphabetically. It's particularly useful. Uh, if you are looking for a place where you say, I'm not quite sure what I saw that written in an old letter that my great grandmother had. And she said, how are all the people doing there in Ballina? And I can't read that last bit. But of course, so many of our townlands start with a common word like drum or Liz or Bally and so on. Uh, and so you could at least go alphabetically to where it starts and say, right, it certainly says Ballina, but I can't read that last bit. And then just run your finger down and say, well, well, it could be that. That could be it there. And of course, speaking to people back home in Ireland is where you can tap into local knowledge to help you solve these sorts of problems. Um, we would get them all the time and they're quite fun. We really enjoy uh, tracking these down. They're almost like a little uh, hide and seek exercise when people send us a query and say, I don't know this place, could you help me find it? And we will uh, do our best to try and cover the, uncover it for them. As well as those websites, both for Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, we have now these wonderful historic map viewers. So you can see digital versions of really old maps available from, in this case, we're looking at the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland's uh, historic map viewer uh, released in conjunction with Ordnance Survey Northern Ireland. And here we have a base map, which will show, you can see the uh, magenta colored lines and the dark blue lines will show parish and uh, county boundaries. So you have a base map and then up here, this little drop down, if you drop that down, you could select a different map from a different series. So the first series dating from the 1830s, maybe the second series from the middle of the 19th century. And you can then 
display the series of the Ordnance Survey maps that you wish to see. And then you can see the actual land divisions, the town lands within that. And bear in mind this, that when our country was mapped, it was the first part of the British Isles to be mapped in a, a serious detail. And it was mapped in the 1830s at the scale of six inches to one mile. And that's an extraordinary amount of detail to contain in a map. So we have that Prosperoni Historic Map Bureau for Northern Ireland. And then we also have a National Townland Map Bureau for the Republic of Ireland from the Ordnance Survey available on their GeoHive website. And you can see we're looking at an area in County Kerry here, and those red little boundaries are showing the individual townlands for the country in that particular part of County Kerry. And as well of all that rich historic, or sorry, rich uh, digital material that we can plunder and explore to our heart's content, all of these are completely free, of course. Don't forget we have excellent paper guides to our land divisions in Ireland. Some of them you may have used yourself in the past before the digital era. The most commonly used is the index to the townlands of Ireland from 1851. So the listing of townlands was drawn from the 1851 census. And what makes it so useful is all the key detail is there in front of you. So you have the sheet number. So that would be the map page that you would need to look at. The townland name itself, the acreage of this townland, then also gives you the county, the barony, the parish, and the poor law union. These are all these historic land divisions that I'm going to talk to you about in this presentation this morning. And of course, you can go beyond that. If you go to Ireland, in some cases, you will get lucky and find the Holy Grail, something like this, an actual detailed map of the estate of a, a, a landowner, and your ancestor may well have been a tenant farmer on an estate and may show on an estate map like this. You can see it's for the map, uh, sorry, the manor of uh, Dungannon at 1710, so that's over 300 years ago. We can see here the outline of the estate, and then it is subdivided, as you can see, showing the individual townlands. And then we can see it's divided again. You can see those little red colored lines. They're actually divided up again, showing the individual holdings of our ancestors there. Um, <clears throat> And down in the corner, we have a listing of the names of the ancestors, the uh, area and the value placed on the land that they were leasing from this landowner in County Tyrone in 1710. Now, they're not very common, those maps, but they're common enough. You know, they're not rare as hen's teeth. You will, in some cases, find them. Now, just to look at Ireland in terms of America and put it in context in terms of its size. It is a very small country, an island of an island off the west coast of Europe. It is probably, you can see it showing there against the state of New York, and we can see it here measured against uh, some of the eastern United States. It would be smaller than all your states west of the Mississippi except Hawaii, and it would be no bigger than most of your states east of the Mississippi except for the very small states in New England, like Vermont or Rhode Island or whatever. It's a pretty small place. It's probably closest in size to South Carolina. So Ireland is about 32,500 square miles. South Carolina is about 32,000. But it's also similar in size to states like Indiana and Maine. So it's a pretty small place. And then it is then divided up into all these land divisions, the four historic ones that we focus on as the most important county. There is... 32 counties. There are 32 counties. There are about 263 or so baronies. There are about two and a half thousand parishes. And then there are over 60,000 little townland units, averaging out about two or 300 acres in size. So when you know that, and that is pinpoint accurate, that's the world your ancestor inhabited. And it really means you can go to town in terms of exploiting the records that may survive. That's the whole point of the exercise. They're used for a period of at least 400 years, all these land divisions, and they are all very old. The county was created, they, the counties of Ireland uh, began to be created when the Anglo-Normans, i.e. the English invaded in the late 12th century. That process took several hundred years. The last two counties of the 32 created were Londonderry in the very north of the country, which was named Londonderry because the English, uh, sorry, the, the London guilds, the medieval guilds of London were invited to manage the plantation of Ulster. I'll be talking about this later on this morning, the plantation of Ulster in that county. It was created out of the old county of Coleraine with little bits of land plucked from Donegal and a barony from 
County Tyrone and renamed Londonderry. So that was in the early years of the 1600s that that county was created. And Wicklow was also one of the last counties, oddly, because it's right there on the doorstep of County Dublin. So the country was divided up into these counties by the English when they invaded and settled. They then began to also to divide up these counties into large chunks called baronies. So the baronies are very old as well. And some of them take very old Irish Gaelic tribal territory names as the name of the barony. So there's a great antiquity there associated with the baronies. It is true that your ancestor probably did not know what barony they lived in. If you asked them in the 1830 or 1740, what barony are you in, they probably wouldn't know. They didn't need to know that information. They would certainly know the county they were in. They would know the parish they lived in. And of course, they would know the townland. They may not know the barony. So people can be quite dismissive and say, oh, baronies, nobody worries about those. But actually, in some parts of Ireland, the barony name would ring loud with your ancestors because it was one of the key identifiers in some locations. Like where I'm from, the Ards, the barony of the Ards, people would use that even today to say where they're from. So the baronies, like the counties, go back around about 800 years in some cases, certainly over 400 years uh, in terms of usage. Uh, and the barony is used in record keeping in the 17th, 18th, 19th, into the late 19th century, and it falls out of usage at that time. The next importance is uh, and size is a parish, the civil parish. Now, there are about two and a half thousand of these across the island of Ireland. And they're very old as well because the, Christ the parish has come to us from the pre-Reformation Western Christian Church, i.e. Catholic Church. And the parish structure was laid down in the 12th century when we had a large number of synods of the Irish church to reorganize the church at that time. And so our parish structure is a good 800 years and more old. So the parishes of Ireland go back a long way, and they're used in record keeping from the 17th century right into the 20th century. The civil parish is a crucial, uh, important land division to know. And then the smallest, which makes it the most important because it is so small, the smallest land division used officially by church and government to record information on our ancestor, and it's the oldest of, of, of the lot. As I said, some of the townland names go back uh, way into our past, more than a thousand years old, and they've been used for at least 400 years in various forms. And knowing that townland is the key to unlocking your research. If you can find the townland, an area of, say, of 200 or 300 acres, you will know then what a state your ancestor is living on. So who is he leasing land from? And then you could go look for rentals and estate records and so on. You would probably know what church he's likely going to go to for Sunday service, where he probably married and baptized his children, where the local graveyard or graveyards are, where you may find headstones for your ancestor. You will know what market town he probably went to to conduct business, you know, buy a horse, sell some sheep, you know, meet his friends and so on. And other records that we have in the archives in Ireland that are available for research, you will know which ones to access because now you have a clear fixed place on exactly where your ancestor came from. It reveals so much and unlocks so much potentially for your research. It's very old, as I say. And also the other point to bear in mind is the name Townland, T-O-W-N, it has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with urban settlement, despite the name. It's a bit of a misnomer. It's thought to come from an old English word, Tunland, T-U-N. And it describes a small settlement area. It's a rural land division. And the whole island of Ireland was covered in these. They were, these were here long before our towns and villages and cities. OK, so they predate everything else in, in most respects. And so even where you now see big cities like Belfast, Dublin, Cork, Limerick, there's a townland structure underneath those. The townlands cover the whole island of Ireland, north and south. So we're going to take a little look at these now um, and just drill in to see them. So we have here um, the island of Ireland and the four provinces, Ulster in the north, Connacht in the west, Le Munster in the south and Leinster in the east. And we see here in dark blue and light blue, the nine counties of the historic province of Ulster. The light blue counties are Northern Ireland, created 100 years ago, plus these three other dark blue counties, Monaghan, Cavan and Donegal, which are now in the Republic of Ireland. But together, all nine of those counties make up what is called Ulster, the historic province of Ulster. Remember, Northern Ireland and Ulster are not interchangeable terms. They do not mean the same thing. Prior to 1920, it's the historic province of Ulster, all nine counties. 
And if you're talking about the area, then it's the north of Ireland or the northern part of Ireland. Northern Ireland specifically is a six county state created at the partition of Ireland 100 years ago. But we're going to zoom into this county here, County Clare, in the province of Munster. While we have our provinces, our provinces are not used for record keeping. The county is the largest administrative unit from the point of view of keeping records. We have 32 of those. We then have 273 barony, sorry, I misspoke myself there earlier. We have two and a half thousand civil parish parishes and over 60,000 little townlands itself. So we're going to drill into County Clare. We can see here now, we're looking at the baronies of County Clare. You can see, for example, Burn, I've highlighted that I'm going to drill into, and other locations like uh, Bunratty and so on. If you've ever travelled in Ireland, you'll know that the uh, cliffs of Moher in the, are in this part of Ireland. Uh, so some of you may have actually visited here. And the burn is rather a unique place. It's a real moonscape sort of landscape. When the ice age, uh, when the glaciers retreated in the last ice age, they just scraped all the soil off their bedrock. So we have these big exposed limestone pavements cut by these deep lush valleys. So it has its own eco-climate and rather rare and special flora and fauna, wonderful place to visit. So we're going to drill into this now, Burn, and we're going to come in here. We can see there are 81 civil parishes in the county of Clare. Nope, they all differ in size. They're not uniform because parishes are made up of townlands and townlands vary in size. So if you have big townlands, you'll have a big parish. If you have small townlands, you may have a small parish. And we're going to zoom in and look at this parish of Kilmoon now. And then within that parish, we can now see it's subdivided up to into 22 little townland units. You can see some of them are very small, like number 19 there. Uh, but we're going to look at number eight, Cacher Bullock. You can see it's quite a large townland. So in a few steps, you're into now a very small piece of land indeed. And the point also to remember is we can go inside the townland. It's almost like get inside the atom. We can go in. The townland can be subdivided further into land in terms of farm holdings, but also minor place names within the townland that your ancestors may have known and used rather than the official names. Remember, there are so many local names for things in Ireland that people will talk in a local patois using local uh, uh, unofficial place names to describe the world they come from and your ancestors may have written those on a letter uh, from home uh, and that's a point to look at when you're looking at old family papers. So we're going to go in now and see the townland here and it's quite big to fit on one screen but you see it's a reverse L shape and we have the boundary here as shown you can see this dark red line here um, and notice here I'm highlighted in uh, both places Another little unit, right, not unit, another little um, um, point of interest right within the townland here. Also, before we move on, you can see these lines going across the townland, dividing it up into individual holdings. So we can actually see from these maps, these are the valuation maps used for Griffith valuation. We can see the actual farm holdings of our ancestors in the middle of the 19th century. And here we have uh, Cocker Bullock here shown in its entirety. So we can go in a few steps from the island of Ireland to the county of Clare, to the barony of Burn, to the parish of Kilmoon, to the townland of Catterbullog, and there we can see three individuals leasing land in Catterbullog from the representatives of Michael Cree. Michael Cree, the landowner, probably has just recently died. We've got the names of the individuals, we've got the plot references here, description of the land, acreage that they are leasing and the value placed on that land. So there you can see how useful. By knowing the townland, we can zoom right in and find our ancestor in a record like this, in a land record. I mentioned that we can actually go in further into these minor place names within a townland. And that little area I was highlighting earlier is Paul Nagolum. That's an Irish word. It means dove hole or dove cave. And it's a proper cave structure uh, that you could go and visit. Very popular in Edwardian times where the gentry would uh, well-to-do would go and would put on Wellington gum boots and go in and inspect this, this cave structure, Paul Nagalum. It's interesting because and it's told in this wonderful series on uh, RTE TV, Creedence Atlas of Ireland. If you ever get the chance to watch 
RTEs at the Credence Atlas of Ireland. You should do so. It gives you such an insight into the Irish relationship with place. And they tell the story in that of this Paul Nagollum in the burn because J.R.R. Tolkien, the guy who writes Lord of the Rings, he went to County Clare and Galway. He actually was a an external examiner in the um, uh, Galway University examinations. And he visited the burn in County Clare and was really taken with the area, including Paul Nagollum. And the locals in this RTE program, they like to tell the story that that is where he got the name for Gollum in is uh, Lord of the Rings. Regrettably, though, an expert pointed out that he had published Lord of the Rings before he had visited this place, so he did not get Gollum from Paul and Gollum. But it's a nice story nonetheless, and the locals like to tell it, and it's told in this story here. But we can see this place, this dove cave or dove hole, is actually recorded, detailed record about it, and available on that Loganium website. And I want to make that point that there are these minor place names which are hugely important if you stumble upon them because they describe not maybe the townland itself at two or 300 acres, but maybe one little part of the townland that is exactly where your ancestor lived. But if you take nothing away else away from this morning, it's that we have these four historic land divisions. And if you can remember that, that's all you need to know. The county, then the barony, then the parish, and then the townland. And you can see them there. The island of Ireland, the provinces, County, Barney, Civil Parish, and Townland. You can see if we go the other route, there are, the, there are these other land divisions like poor law unions, dispensary districts, electoral divisions. You don't need to worry so much about those, although I am going to try and mention uh, poor law unions in the time that I've got available to me. Uh, these land units are created in the 19th century for specific purposes by government. Um, and they don't fit neatly into the historic land divisions. The historic land divisions do fit relatively neatly together. Counties and the baronies, parishes, townlands, like little stacking dolls, uh, if you imagine that. These other ones, not quite so much. They often just run right across the boundaries of the old land divisions. But you don't need to be overly uh, aware of them. And it's the rich heritage of the parish and townland names that really you want to understand and tap into. In his book, Notes from a Small Island, Bill Bryson, uh, born in Des Moines, Iowa, he wrote this in the mid-1990s about Britain, and he said, but nowhere, of course, are the British more gifted than with place names. There are some 30,000 names in Britain, a good half of them, I guess, notable or rescued in some way. And, and that is true, of course, but it would not compare to the richness of the name culture we have for our places in Ireland when we have over 60,000 townland names alone. In this book, Irish Place Names, the Flanagans write, in addition to being divided into four provinces and 32 counties, in their turn divided into bar baronies and parishes, all of them having names, Ireland is fur further divided into some 60,000 townlands, all of which again have names, though many of them, of course, of course share the same fairly descriptive name. Lots of ballys and tullies and drums and liz and so on. Many names meaning the same thing. Inside these townlands, the smallest official unit, and that's the crucial point, the smallest official unit used for recording information are many minor place names, sometimes averaging out to 20 per or 30 per townland. If you do the maths, do 20 times 60,000. That's a lot of place names. But they go on to say, although an intensive ground survey has revealed as many as 800 minor names in a single townland in County Mayo. I mean, just think of that in terms of numbers. This amounts to an enormous number of place names running into many millions. Um, just gives you an idea of the richness. In his book, John Mogie writes, they know every tree, every rock, every field and house, and most of the tales and legends associated with them. And that is really true. If you have ever traveled, we spoke to one gentleman this morning who has traveled in Ireland. If you travel in Ireland, speak to the rural community, especially, especially the farming community who have such a connection with the land, you will get a sense of that place, that sense of place, that oneness they have. You know, they're at home there. You see that in the Irish when you visit them in your in the locations that they live. And that's what you're tapping into, that richness, getting back into that. And a point to bear in mind when you think about Larry's Irish land divisions is that you have a ready-made grid of about 60,000 units, averaging about 200 acres in size. You could use it for your research. So search by place as opposed to search by surname. 
we think using these modern databases, well, I'll just look for my great grandfather's name. But an Irish surname could be spelled any way and every way in the record, as we've tried to establish already this morning. So you may be, you know, come up against a brick wall, because how do you spell O'Shaughnessy or McGuinness? There could be 20 different ways to spell each of those names. But if you know the place name, the townland name, you could just search the resource via the place name. Many of our databases, like the census records and so on, allow you to search by place. And you could just zoom in and look at that. Because if we look at this, most of us are most of us here are looking for ancestors prior to the Great Famine before 1850. And if we see here at the time of the Great Famine, the population density of Ireland, about 8 million people on the island at this point, spread right across the country. They're living across the land at this time in these little units. That's why searching by place can be so useful to you. Just going to go in now and look at the location where my people are from in the county of Down. So again, we have the county boundary here, the city of Belfast, and then we have got the baronies here that I mentioned. So you can see large chunks of land. I'm from this barony here, the barony of the Ards. We then can drill into the parishes, the civil parishes of Ulster. Here we've got 70 civil parishes in County Down. Note some are large, like in the area of the Mourne Mountains here, poor quality land, big townlands, big parish. Here in Lakeel or the Ards, good quality land, small townlands, very small parishes. So they're not unique or they're not uniform in size, as I say. Do bear in mind that what we were looking at there are the civil parishes of Ireland, and that's the important land division, the civil parish, because you will find there are Episcopalian Church of Ireland parishes, which are practically the same thing as the civil parish structure. And you also have Catholic parishes, but the Catholic parishes do not fit neatly within the civil parish structure if you're looking for Catholic ancestors. The Catholic Church, when it emerged from the penal laws in the late 18th and early 19th century, it reorganized its church on the realities of that time 200 years ago, not the realities of 1534 when the Reformation took place. So the parish structure is based on where the Catholics were living, say, in 1800 or 1790. And that's why the parish structure is often different. Larger parishes maybe have different parish names. And then the Presbyterians, they don't organize under a parish structure at all, but under a congregational structure. Congregations grouped into presbyteries, grouped into synod. So you have that little variation there. But it doesn't matter because when you're researching your ancestors, irrespective of their religion, it is the parish, the civil parish that's important. So here we have in the Pronies Guide to Church Record, the civil parish of Ard Straw in County Throne, but we have all these different churches listed under the one land division. So the civil parish of Ard Straw, we have Church of Ireland, Methodist, Presbyterian, Catholic, Reformed Presbyterian, all with different names that might imply a different location, and yet all of them listed under the civil parish. It's the civil parish that is important. And just very quickly to finish, I just want to mention also one of those land units created in the 19th century, because you may be interested in records of the workhouse. Now, that's not to imply your ancestor might have died in the workhouse or was in the workhouse, although, of course, they could have been because many people had a hard life in Ireland. But the poor law union is important because it was a basis of local administration for the collecting of a rate, i.e. a tax, to pay for the upkeep. So our ancestor, for example, could show up in a record relating to a taxation gathered for the upkeep of the poor. And at the end of our ancestor's life, they could possibly have went into the workhouse infirmary, not because they were poor, but that is the only hospital in the locality at this point in time. And they may have died, you know, many of our old ancestors, old folk would have died maybe of um, something like, you know, um, pneumonia, uh, often took, you know, the old man's friend, as it's called, back home. Uh, and so our ancestors may be in the records of the poor law union, not because they are poor, but because they maybe are just ill or maybe they are contributing as well. So these poor law unions are established in 1838 and there are 163 of them. They are different from our parishes and townlands because they take a large market town at the heart and a, an area, a, a hinterland of about 10 or 12 miles radius around that market town is designated the poor law union. The tax is gathered from that union. A workhouse is built in the market town for the upkeep of the poor. And just to show you this in action, to finish, you may hear like a place like 
Ballyshannon, Ballyshannon and County Donegal is a large market town in the south of the county. And you hear the the, the poor law union of Ballyshannon and you think, well, that's going to be Donegal. But actual fact, it is indeed Donegal, but the poor law union of Ballyshannon actually takes in land in Fermanagh and in Leitrim. So Fermanagh's in Northern Ireland, Leitrim and Donegal are in the Republic of Ireland, and they are all within that catchment area of the Ballyshannon Poor Law Union. So just bear that in mind when you're considering the records. And just also, just to show you this in action here, we go back to our civil parish maps in County Down, and we can see the uh, bar the Poor Law Union of Downpatrick here on Newtown Ards here. And you can see that the Poor Law Union boundary runs right across Parish 45, across 20, 32, 37, and right across those parish boundaries. So it's just by way of making the point that the Poor law unions established in the early 19th century used for records relating to the workhouse, board of guardian records, they're called. They don't fit neatly into our old parish structure. And incidentally, the poor law unions are also then reused, repurposed for civil records of birth, marriages and deaths that Gillian talked about. So the poor law union is basically the same thing as the superintendent registrar district. Now we'll stop here and go to a break, but just using the Griffith valuation as a slide to reinforce these land divisions, we can see it in action here. The County of Meath, the Barony of Kells Upper, the poor law union of Kells, the parish of Balrock Boy, or Boyne, and the townland of Athke and Little. You see there, all those units we've talked this morning on the one source. The same thing for Donegal. I chose that one as there because we see the county of Donegal, the barony of Turkey, but the poor law union of Donegal, the parish of Donegal. You see Donegal is repeated three times. It's a county. It is also a poor law union. It is also a parish. Just to make the point, there's a lot of repetition in our place names, and sometimes the same name will be at the different levels in terms of it may be a county name, but it also could be a parish name. Okay, we'll stop there, and we are going to take a 10-minute break. So you're welcome to get a, grab a coffee or a water, use the restrooms, browse the books, or if you have any questions for Gillian and me, be happy to answer them. Okay. Oh, yes. We're also, Gillian's just going to leave at the couple of empty chairs here. We have got some reference books here. We've got The Surnames of Ireland by Edward McLeisett and Bell's Book of Ulster Surnames. We are selling them on the table, but if you want to just browse, uh, please, if you use these ones so the copies on the table don't get dog-eared, happy browse away at them. They'll be there all through the day. And we will resume again at 25 past with Gillian's next presentation. So this next session is going to be on records related to the different churches in Ireland. <clears throat> One of the main things to recognize with churches is the different denominations, the history of the different church denominations affects the kind of records that exist and the time period that they will cover. We're going to look at some of the main baptisms, marriages, and burial registers just a little bit later. But to start with, I wanted to just highlight some of the main key dates, a very brief overview, but just to show you the kind of variation that we have. Now, the Baptist Church was in Ireland from the mid-1600s, but it was a very, very small denomination until well into the 1800s. And most of their records start from that date. If you have Baptists in your family, we would suggest that in most cases, you're looking at a different Protestant denomination in Ireland that they belong to. So they may have become Baptist when they moved over here. For a long time, the Baptist Union of Ireland held their records, but they have recently been allowing the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland to be digitizing their records to be available in that archive in Belfast. And that does include Baptist meeting houses in Dublin. We'll look at that a bit more a little bit later, the importance of looking at the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland for all church records, even those in the South. Now, the Church of Ireland, as we mentioned before, was the state church, the established church in Ireland before 1870. And for that reason, a lot of their records are much earlier than other denominations. There were actually instructions given out in 1634 that ministers had to keep, start keeping records of baptisms and burials. But unfortunately, we lost 60% of those in that 1922 fire. 
um, and not every minister kept records from 1634. The one thing I w- would emphasize is that there's no one start date to church records, either by area or by denomination. Each parish will have a different start date or a, date, a, a different date that they survive from. So one parish, you might get back to the 1600s, but the parish might right beside it might not have records before 1850. So it just depends it does mean in some branches of your family, you can go back and church records really far. In other re- in other branches of your family, you may need to use other, other sources like landed estate papers. Pre- um, the one thing about the Church of Ireland was that they considered everybody who lived within the parish and who paid the parish tax, the tithe, to be a parishioner. And that meant that they were eligible to be buried in the parish graveyard. And that's one thing we would emphasize if you're looking at burial records or gravestone inscriptions, even if it says now a Church of Ireland graveyard, in the past that would have been a parish graveyard. So you would have found Presbyterians and Catholics, Methodists, as well as the Church of Ireland people buried in that graveyard. Because of the penal period, when anyone who wasn't Anglican was restricted by law from fully practicing their faith, You'd also find that some families choose to have their ceremonies in the Church of Ireland to make sure that it was all above board and legal in the eyes of the law, even if on a Sunday they were attending their own church. Now, not every family did that, but you do find it occasionally. So what that means for both of those reasons, we would always recommend that when you've finished exploring the records that of the denomination your family belonged to, always check the local Church of Ireland registers because you might just you might just find a little bit more information on your ancestors. Now, the Presbyterian Church came over from Scotland in sixteen. Well, the early 1600s, 1613 is the kind of date that they they um, claim as the start, and for that reason, the largest concentration of Presbyterian churches is in counties Antrim and Down, the two counties that are physically closest to Scotland. Most Presbyterian churches are in the north of Ireland, the northern province of Ulster. So if you have Presbyterians in your family and you're not sure where they came from in Ireland, we would recommend you start in the north. Now, there are some Presbyterian churches in the south, particularly around Dublin, County Louth, but there are much fewer. Now, we do have some Presbyterian registers from 1690s, but a lot of them start around 1819, 1820, um, when instructions were given out by that church that the ministers had to start keeping records. And again, that was probably also a consequence of the relaxation of the penal laws. As a consequence of those laws, before 1782, Presbyterians ministers were not supposed to conduct marriages. And even as late as 1845, they could not conduct what they what were called a mixed marriage between a Presbyterian and a non-Presbyterian. So for that reason, again, you may find that marriage taking place within the Church of Ireland, even if one of them was a Presbyterian. Now, the Methodist, um, Methodist Church came over from England in 1747. But Methodists in the beginning were, con- were encouraged to continue or continue to belong to their original church. So even though they were meeting weekly as Presbyterian as Methodists, they were always set up those fellowship meetings at a time that didn't conflict with other churches in the area. So they tended to go to their church in the morning and then meet in fellowship as Methodists set up mid-afternoon. Most Methodists came from the Church of Ireland, although you do find a few who came from Presbyterian Church, or Catholic Church, or Quaker Church. Now, in 1816, there was a, a division in the Methodist faith. Um, primitive Wesleyan Methodists uh, gave their ministers authority to start conducting baptisms and burials and communion, whereas primitive, um, primitive Methodists continue to hold those ceremonies in the Church of Ireland. So if you're looking for early Methodists, it is likely you will find those in the Church of Ireland. Even at those early baptismal records from 1816, those are only one half of the Methodist Church. The other half was still using the Church of Ireland. In 1878, they amalgamated, and then you get full Methodist records after that. Now, the Moravian Church came over from Eastern Europe in 1746. There were only a few Moravian churches in Ireland. It's quite a small denomination, but they have excellent records back from 1746. And another church is well worth uh, finding an ancestor belonging to is the Religious Society of Friends, the Quakers. 
Um, and they came over to Ireland from the north of England with an English businessman. He went to Dublin in 1652, and then he'd moved north to Lurgan, a market town in County Armagh, in 1654, where the first Quaker meeting house was opened in Ireland. And then the following year, in 1655, they sent two female missionaries down to Cork to open, uh, to set up a fellowship in the city of Cork there. Quakers have excellent continuous records from the 1650s, um, full of wonderful information. And then we have the largest denomination in Ireland, the Roman Catholic Church. Now, really, as a consequence of those that penal period um, from the six, late 1600s, um, when particularly Catholics, but also Quakers and Presbyterians, anyone who wasn't Anglican was, as I said, restricted from fully practicing their faith. Um, there was a lack of record keeping in that period, as you can understand, because the last thing you want to do if you're being prosecuted or persecuted in your area is to keep a paper record of the ceremonies and the services that you're holding kind of secretly. Um, and unfortunately, that kind of lack of record keeping kind of continued even when the penal laws were beginning to be relaxed. And what that means is in some areas, Catholic registers start quite late. Um, what we notice is they start much earlier in the south and east of Ireland and the north and west of Ireland start much later. Just to give you an example there, the average start date of Catholic registers in County Clare, which is halfway down the west coast of Ireland, is 1830s, 1840s, whereas the average start date of Catholic ancestors in County Dublin is 1740s, 1750s. You can see a hundred, almost a hundred year difference there. Now, there is st still quite a lot of uh, discussion over why that might be. Why are the records earlier in one part of Ireland than the other? Um you tend to get early Catholic registers in places like Waterford and Wexford and Dublin. Those are port towns. Um, and one of the areas that wasn't affected by penal laws was business. So Catholics were restricted by, by those laws from some occupations. So they couldn't be, for example, teachers. There were other restrict jobs restricted to them. But business was not restricted by these laws. So you get in that period a growing class of of Catholic merchants, Catholic businessmen. So there is some thinking that perhaps the authorities in those towns recognized that these Catholic businessmen were bringing in quite a lot of money into the community and they it would be better if they turned a blind eye to whatever was happening in the church in case then the businessmen decided to move somewhere else and bring the profits in somewhere else if they crack down that's one suggestion but it is something worth bearing in mind in some cases if you are searching for any catholic ancestors they sometimes the registers start too late now these are a few books that are really good to kind of dig into those denominational histories um the one on the top left there, Irish Church Records, edited by James G. Ryan. We have that on our book table. It's a really good introduction because it has a chapter on all the major church denominations written by an expert from that particular denomination. We also have on the book table, Researching Presbyterian Ancestors in Ireland by our research director, William Rolston, there in the top right. Um, if you have Presbyterian ancestors, th this is an excellent guide, so don't leave without it. And also we have brought back into print Patrick Corrish's Catholic community in the 17th and 18th century. I really enjoyed the Methodists of Ireland in Ireland. It's a very accessible introduction to that denomination. And these two books by Maynooth Research Guide for Irish Local History, the records of the Irish Church, Catholic Church, the blue one, and the Church of Ireland records um, by Raymond Refuso. They're excellent. I think they're both out of print now, but you might be able to get them online or from a library. The two on the bottom right are um, big kind of hardback coffee table books. They're really lovely to look at. There's a photograph of each church in, the, in Ireland, Presbyterian or Church of Ireland, with a few lines of the history. And there's really in, good introductions to both those denominations at the start of those books. Now, I mentioned our online bookstore for those of you at home. Uh, booksisland.org.uk um, and you can purchase any of our books there and we can ship them out to you. So these are the main registers that you will find within the church collection. You have registers of baptisms, marriages and burials and those are the records I want to look at with you this morning because those are the ones that have the most genealogical information in them. 
But we're also going to finish off by touching on vestry minute books and session minute books and confirmation and communicant lists, what I call kind of administrative papers within the church, uh, the lesser known records within the church. So baptismal records, one thing I would emphasize about all these registers, the clergy were just told to keep a record of a baptism, marriage and burial, but they were not told what information they had to record. So it varies between church to church and even within a church from minister to minister. Some minister might record lots of information. Another minister might record quite limited information. So a baptismal register will usually provide the name of the child, the date of baptism and the name of the father. Often the mother's name is not included as if she didn't have anything to do with the whole situation. <laughs> Now, as time went on and they started using, you know, the pre-printed registers, you're more likely to then get more information such as date of birth, residence, mother's name, including sometimes her maiden name, sometimes occupation of the father, because there's those fields within the printed book that asks for the mother's name. And then that prompts the clergy man to ask that question. But I just want to show you a few examples to show you the range of information that you may get. This is a nice early one, Cardinal Presbyterian Church 1710, and we can see it has the date of baptism, the name of the child, and the name of the father. Another early one, Inish Keel Church of Ireland, and this is a, a useful one because they have included the mother's name or the first name of the mother in this register. The Inish McSean Church of Ireland from the 1660s is quite unusual because it has the godparents' names. Now, there are often godparents in the Church of Ireland, but they're generally not recorded in the baptismal register. So thanks to this minister who did record them. And godparents are often um, brothers and sisters of the mum and dad, aunts and uncles of the child. So it allows you to start exploring another generation. Catholics always had the sponsors recorded in the register, and we'll see an example of that a little bit later. This one is Port of Ferry Church of Ireland from 1785, and the first entry, I know it's quite hard to read, says Robert, natural son of Elizabeth Lewis, reputed father is Robert Cardy. Now, this is an, a really interesting one. First of all, the minister has said natural son. Unfortunately, a lot of clergymen used quite unpleasant terms to describe illegitimate children and you will come across that in some of the baptismal records but interestingly within the civil registration period post 1864 um, a mother couldn't list the father's name on the birth record if they weren't married if he wasn't present with her registering the birth and it was to try and avoid um, mothers listing a man's name on the birth record who wasn't the biological father but what that means is quite often the father, you know, was busy at work and couldn't come and register the child's birth. So just because there isn't a father's name on a child's birth certificate doesn't actually mean that, that there wasn't a father present in their lives. The parents weren't married, but it doesn't mean an absent father, as you might sometimes suggest, you know, as it might sometimes suggest. You are more likely to find a father's name in a baptismal record. Not always. Sometimes you will just get the mother's name in the baptismal record. But as you can see here, sometimes that is recorded, either because the father is at the baptism, because he's present in the child's life, or because the minister, the priest, just knew his congregation, knew his prisoners, and just knew who the father was. Or in this case, you can tell Robert Cardy isn't present at this baptism, but it is still recorded that the, he was the reputed father. Actually, within the Catholic Church, there was a time period where it was a legal requirement. Um, it was a, 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 sorry, a church requirement that the father's name was recorded in the baptismal record if they weren't married. And that's because, understandably, the Catholic Church was quite worried about future accidental incest where two half-siblings start dating, not realizing that they share a biological father. So if it's in the baptismal record, the child themselves know, know who the name of the biological father, as does the whole community. So it is something you sometimes will come across. Similar, um, this is the same church a few years later, 1792, and it says, Jane, daughter of Mary and William Kerr, a periwig maker. Now, it may be that that's quite an unusual occupation is why the minister wrote it, because he doesn't record the occupation of anybody else 
in this uh, church register, or it may be that there were two couples in this parish called Mary and William Kerr. And that can be really confusing when you're searching church records if the minister or the priest hasn't recorded the mother's maiden name because sometimes you don't realize that there's two couples of the same name until you realize that they had apparently two children two months apart. You think mm, the maths isn't working here. <laughs> it must be two separate families. And then it can sometimes be different, difficult to differentiate. So the fact that he's put the occupation much, makes it much easier. Now, this is Donahedi Church of Ireland, 1755. And you can see in this instance, they have recorded the child's name, whether they were legitimate. I'm always suspicious of the big inks blood here. Uh, the gender of the child, the father's name, and the townland of, and the date of baptism. So you can see that, as Finton was telling you about just in the previous session, the, knowing the townland is really useful. Because even if you've got quite an uncommon surname, when you get back to the parish where your family come from, suddenly you see the surname everywhere. So one of the ways that you can kind of clarify the different branches is to associate them with the particular townlands that they're living in within that parish. So it's really helpful that the minister has recorded the townland in this register. Now, this is another one uh, from Toba Key Presbyterian, and this is quite unusual. It says James grandson of Alexander McKeenan. Um, so the parents aren't recorded there. Now, it's possible they had died, but it's also possible that perhaps they were not members of this church, but they were happy for the grandfather to have the child baptized in the church. So it's the grandfather's name listed in the register because he's a member of this particular Presbyterian church. Now, we really like this minister. This is Reverend Robert McGill of First Antrim Presbyterian. This is 1820. You can see that he's drawn columns of information. And this is so helpful for us because I'm going to be showing you the websites where you can access your church records. But there is an awful lot of church records that are still not online. We have a lot of churches in Ireland. Um, and so in some cases, you may have to do the old way of researching, which is look through a church register, page by page, entry by entry. And some clergy like to write a little paragraph for each child. And it means you have to read a lot of words before you can even extract the surname, before you know whether it's even the surname you're looking for. So it can be quite time consuming. Whereas in this particular example, we can see that the child's name is listed in the first column and you would be running your eye down that first column. And until you, you hit on the surname you're interested in, you can ignore the rest of the page. So it means it's much quicker for you to search if you are having to read entry by entry. So we have the name of the child, then we have the date of birth, we have the date of baptism, we have the name of the father, we have the name of the mother with her maiden name, and we have the townland. So practically everything that we could wish for here in this particular register. Now, one thing to bear in mind is where there is only a date of birth and no, a date of baptism and no date of birth. With Catholics, because of the church belief and unbaptized children, Catholic children tended to be baptized on the day of birth or the day after birth, very close. Um, and in most cases, then the mother wasn't at the baptismal ceremony because she was still recovering from the labor. So where you have a Catholic baptism, generally that is very, very close to the date of birth. Um, if they're a bit older, the priest often notes that because it's quite unusual. So in case of Church of Ireland, uh, they tended to be quite young when they baptized their children, but Presbyterians sometimes waited a few years before they baptized their children. And we can see an example of this. Most of the children on this slide are 10 days, 14 days old when they're baptized. But if we look near the bottom, uh, James Kirkpatrick is six years old and his sister Jane is two and they are baptized on the same day. Now, if, you, this was, if James was your own sister, this is 1820, the register. Um, and you might know from a gravestone or a military record or some other record that he was born in 1814. And if you were looking manually through the register, you would know to look a few years either side, because we know later ages and later records are not always accurate. 
But I don't know if you would think to go right up to 18, 20, six years after he was born. So I always say to people, if they're searching manually, search a few years either side, keep searching until you're really, really fed up, and then just search one more year, because sometimes it's that one year that gets you the results. Um, the other thing I've noticed with a few families, and this isn't common, but I have seen it on a number of occasions, is they wait till they finish their family and then they baptize them all at once. I don't know if they got some kind of discount. <laughs> but if you know the year, roughly when the youngest sibling was born, do make sure you check the register up to about a year after their birth. And again, you might capture them. Now, this is the Skibbereen Circuit, the Methodist Church, County Cork. So when those Methodist communities started um, being set up, they didn't have individual churches like most denominations did. They had different fellowship groups, and then they had a preacher who traveled on a circuit of Presbyterian um, Methodist fellowships. Um, so sometimes they had to wait a little while to baptize their children, and all the registers um, in from this period relate to whole circuit rather than an individual church, because the preacher literally kept the registers in his saddlebag as he moved from place to place. This is Dromal Catholic Church in County Antrim, baptismal record from 1886. And we have the date of just moving across the screen there. We have the date of baptism. We have the name of the child, the name of the parents, their residents and the sponsors. Those are the godparents. And again, like I say, often aunts and uncles of the child. One thing to bear in mind when it's laid out like this, it can be a little bit misleading. If we see that first entry, it says Manus Kelly. And then under the parents, there's a column that says John. And then there's a column that says Bridget McKenna. Now, some people read that as Manus Kelly. Kelly is his middle name and his parents are John and Bridget McKenna. But actually, his surname is Kelly. His father is John Kelly. And his mother is Bridget and her maiden name is McKenna. Now, you can understand why some people have read that slightly differently, but it is that first column that has the surname in it. And that column is the mother's maiden name. Now, something else that's really useful within Catholic records is if the, the child grows up and then wants to marry outside of their parish, they needed to show proof they'd been baptized before they could be married. So they are usually the priest where they're going to get married, uh, writes back to the, the priest back at home, asks him to send a copy of the baptismal record. And then at that point, the priest records the marriage details in the baptismal register back in Ireland. And this can be a great clue. If you can just about make out halfway down the screen there, Dennis Pettigrew, is baptized in County Antrim in 1886. But can you see there's like a different, there's a little bracket here and then there's a different hand underneath. It then says that he married Anne O'Reilly Murray. She's a widow. So we have a maiden name and the surname of her first husband in New York City in 1948. We have the exact date of marriage and the place of marriage. Now, Dennis might be your ancestor and you knew he married there in 1948 in New York, but you just weren't sure where he came from in Ireland. Because this is entered in, you know you find his baptism, you know you find his parish, and you can explore the records in Dromal. Or perhaps Dennis was an uncle of one of your ancestors, and you he seemed to just disappear out of the records. You never found a marriage record for him in Ireland. You didn't know where he disappeared to. Well, now you know he was in New York City in 1948, and you can explore that. So the fact that they record that extra information back in Ireland in the baptismal register is really useful. Now, we um, transcribe church records for counties Antrim and Down, including Belfast, um, and we we borrowed um, the baptismal record from, register from St. Patrick's in Belfast, and in it we found all these letters and little cards slipped in by the priest. Um, and this is a perfect example of the notification that is sent back home. This is a notification of marriage. You can see by this stage, this is mid 20th century. It's a printed card. Mary, Queen of Heaven in Illinois. John Michael Joseph McLean in the bottom left there, baptized in St. Patrick's Belfast in 1916 and married Elizabeth Catherine Kane in 1945 in Illinois. And that slipped back in because John was baptized in this church in 1916. And just another couple of examples. Um, these examples are all from counties Antrim and Down because those are the church records we access. But you're going to find this kind of information across the island of Ireland. 
This is Henry Rooney, um, and he is baptized in St. Matthew's Catholic Church in Belfast in 1891. And then there's a note underneath at the bottom there that says he married Julia Gilmore in Lewisham, London in 1909, and they were in transit to Montreal, Canada. So we know who, we know who he married, when and where, and we know at the very least they were intending to travel to Montreal. And then another example, Michael McCourt. Michael was baptized in County Down in 1888. And then there's a later note by the priest in his parish to say that he was ordained in 1922 in Maynooth College, which is still the training college for priests nowadays. And he was going on mission to China. So because he joined the priesthood, the priest back at home was very proud. And he enters that in Michael's baptismal record. So those are the baptisms. Then I want to touch on marriage records. And again, the information can vary. You will usually get the name of the bride and groom and the date of marriage. But again, as time went on, you were more likely to get helpful information like the name of the fathers or the residence where the bride and groom live, their age, their marital status, sometime their occupation. But it does vary. So again, nice and early, current money, Presbyterian Church, 1712 to 16, this page. And you can see we just have the date of marriage and the name of the bride and groom, and that is it. But sometimes you'll get more information. This is an example from St. Peter's Catholic Church in Belfast, 1866. And we have the name of the bride and groom. We have their address and we have their father's name. Now, that is all fairly typical. What you also have in this uh, Catholic marriage record is the name of the mothers, both their first name and their maiden name. Now, you will never get that on a civil marriage record. There simply isn't a, a field for the mother's name. And it's something that uh, there's a project trying to get the mother's name onto marriage records at, at home at this moment. Um, I've seen it occasionally in Protestant marriages, but it's not very common. But you can see how helpful this is. We know that Jane is marrying in Belfast in 1866. She's maybe in her 20s. So we don't know that for sure. And we know her father is Patrick Hanna. So you're maybe looking for the baptism of Jane, daughter of Patrick Hanna, in the 1840s. Well, there's going to be quite a few of them. But now that we have the mother's name, we can also search the Jane, daughter of Patrick Hanna and Mary Ann McGurk. Although always remembering that some priests won't have recorded the mother's name on the baptismal record. But we can also look for the marriage of Patrick Hanna and Mary Ann McGurk. And we can even look for parishes where the surname Hannah and McGurk occur. So there's just so much more that we can look for because we have the mother's name of both the bride and groom. But not only that, the priest has also recorded where the parents come from. Now, their address on a marriage record is literally the address the day they marry. So it's not always their usual residence and it's certainly not always their place of birth, although it can be because some people will have stayed in the same place. In, in this example, Belfast was the fastest growing town in the British Isles in the late 1800s. Lots of people moving into Belfast for work, particularly young people, as the industrialization started and the linen mill started to be set up in Belfast. So it doesn't surprise us to find out that actually Jane and Michael are not from Belfast. Um, we can see that Jane's parents are from County Monaghan, which is still in the northern province of Ulster. But Michael's parents are from County Clare. Now, that's halfway down the west coast of Ireland. Still a significant difference between Belfast and County Clare even today. And not just County Clare, but we have the town of Innis Timon listed there on the bottom. So that's hugely helpful because, like I say, the, the address is sometimes... Uh, particularly for men, traditionally in Ireland, you marry in the wife's church and then you attend the husband's church after marriage. So sometimes you see the same address on a marriage record and you think, oh, maybe they were cohabiting, which they may have been. But quite often, actually, the groom has moved in with his future in-laws the night before the wedding to be closer to the wife's church. So it is literally his address on the day he marries rather than his usual address. So that sometimes can throw people. So the fact that we have the parents' addresses, that's much more likely to be the actual place where Jane and Michael originate from. And you can see in this register, it was actually uh, in the pre-printed registers of this period was actually asked for. So we have the name of the bride and groom, their address, 
the name of the parents and their address and the name of the witnesses and their address. And that's really helpful because, again, just like godparents, sponsors and baptismal records, witnesses on marriage records are all, sometimes friends, but often sisters and brothers of the bride and groom. And even if you don't immediately recognize um, the names, you may find with further research that that's a brother-in-law or a married sister, and you just didn't know that that name was associated with your family. Sometimes you find that two witnesses a year later marry. So quite often, maybe they've met at the wedding and then they've they've started a relationship and got married the following year. So I've been able to um, put together a whole family tree just by cross-referencing the addresses of the bride and groom and the addresses of the witness. But interestingly, this is St. Patrick's Catholic Church in Belfast, but the parents are coming from County Lip Limerick, County Derry, County Down, County Carlow, County Meath, County Kerry, right down in the southwest. Now, there was a barracks uh, close to this church, so it's likely that a lot of the men who were marrying here actually were soldiers that were based in Belfast, but were from other parts of Ireland. But you can imagine how helpful this is um, if your family were in Belfast or Dublin for a period and you're not sure where they come from. So a huge amount more information on these other church records. But on the flip side of this, this is the marriage of Robert Merland, and this is the the note that's in the church register. We have the date of marriage, the name Robert Merlin and, and Trina, the two uh, witnesses and the townland they lived in. So not very much information. But if we look at the civil record, we have the names, their ages, their marital status, their occupation, the townland, their father's names and their father's occupation, as well as the two witnesses. So the thing I would emphasize to you is when you get into the civil registration period, sometimes people, they just get a birth certificate and then they don't bother with the baptism or they just get a burial record and they don't bother with the death certificate. If there is two records from two different sources out there, one is the church, one is the government, do get them both. Now, you may find that they contain exactly the same information. But in these examples, what I've been trying to show is that sometimes one of them will have a little bit more and that little bit more can help you push back in your family. Now, the burial registers are uh, the most uninformative, sadly. Um, they have much more limited information. You will usually get the name of deceased and the date of burial. You'll often get their age and their residence. You will sometimes get their occupation or any circumstance, circumstances of the death if it's unusual. Um, but the next slide I want to show you shows the limitations of this. This is a burial register. Now, it's obviously very early, and you can see it's it's been quite damaged. Clougher Church of Ireland, um, 1699. And this is an impressive burial register because you would think that at the most basic, you would have the name of the deceased on a burial register. This burial register does not have the name of the deceased. <laughs> quite extraordinary. Instead, what it says is, William Armstrong's father, William Hamilton's child, <laughs> Alexander Kirk's wife. So we have the head of the households and their relationship with the deceased. It's it's, un, it's quite unbelievable, really. Now, luckily, this is the only one I've seen of this. There may be the odd example, but I just wanted to include it because it shows you the, the real limitations sometimes in these burial registers. Now, this is a much more typical one. Donna Heady from 1830, the name of the deceased. Then we have their address, the date they were buried and their age. And their address, just as Fenton was showing you earlier, is Donna Heady Parish. You can see that listed. And then these place names above are the townlands. So you have Glen Mahon, Castle Warren, and Liss Clean. Those would be townlands. So sometimes when you're looking in a record and you come across a place name, it doesn't seem to be a parish, then that indeed may be the townland. And that's when you would use those townland resources that are in your handout. Just to show you again the variation, I came across this one a few months ago, Drumrah Church of Ireland, um, 1831. And we have George Buchanan, age nine years of Taddy Keel. That's the townland. You can see how these townlands are appearing in a lot of these records. He died the 22nd of January, 1831, and he was buried the 24th of January, 1831, in the burial ground of Drumrah. 
Um, but just below that, we have another child, but there's more information recorded about her. Maria Parker, daughter of Samuel and Sarah Parker. And we have her parents' names because her father was a soldier in His Majesty's 83rd Regiment, quoted in Omar Barracks, and then her date of death and her date of burial. Um, now, you can see that because they were strangers, the minister has recorded more information. But poor George up, up here, he was a parishioner. Everybody knew him. Everybody knew his family, knew his parents. So the minister didn't think to record his parents' names in the burial register. But with a stranger, they have recorded more information. So you can see with some circumstances, information does vary. Now, this is Christchurch Church of Ireland burial register in Belfast. When Christchurch was established, Belfast was already a growing town and there was no room for a graveyard around it. So this is really valuable to us because the minister then recorded where each person had been buried. So you can see there's a column there on the right. Most of them were buried in other graveyards in Belfast, Shankill Graveyard, um, uh, Balmoral Graveyard. We have Belfast City Cemetery, but a few of them are buried outside of Belfast. So Ellen Little, the third one down on the right, is buried in Carrickfergus. That's a market town in County Antrim. And Eliza Jean Graham is buried in Drumbo. That's a village in County Down. Now, the only reason you would go to all the, the cost and the time and the and the effort of burying someone outside of the place where they were living is if they already had a family connection to that place. There was maybe already a family plot that they were being buried in. So this is really helpful for us because, like I say, when people move into large towns or cities, it sometimes can be hard to push them back to where they originate from. But now we know to focus our research on that Ellen Little in Carrick Fergus area and Eliza Jane in Drumbo area. So that itself is a clue. And just another funeral register for you. This is uh, 1889, Bryansford and Newcastle Catholic Church um, in County Down, where the Moan Mountains are. And you can see in most cases, the priest just records the name, Hugh Gribbon, the townland, Tully Branahan, aged 17 years and buried in Bryansford. There were two cemeteries in this parish. But if we look at the second one down, Sally Sloan of Burren, aged 61 years, found drowned in the garden well. So a really sad way to go because it's very unusual. The priest has recorded the circumstances of her death in the funeral register. Now, because this is within the civil registration period, I then looked for her death certificate. And that's what I mean about there being two kind of sources of information. So the first thing I noticed was on the death certificate, she's the middle entry. She's recorded as Sarah Sloan. So that's her given name. but she was known in the in the parish by her pet name, Sally, and that's what's recorded in the funeral register by her priest. She's actually 62 on her death certificate. She's 61 in the funeral register. So again, a year like that wouldn't, wouldn't bother me at all in terms of this being the right person. You can see she's a farmer's sister. Now, in most cases on death records, it's a relative who registers the death. It had to be someone present at the death. But in this case, because of the circumstances of her death, there was an, an inquest and it's actually the coroner who has registered her death um, and he has decreed that it was accidental drowning. Something to look out for there, although we don't have the name of her brother, as we probably would have done if she had had a, a more typical death, there is often a write-up in the local newspaper of inquests. There are a few inquest papers in the archives, but not very many. But if you ever come across a coroner registering a death, do look in the local newspapers. That can be a really profitable avenue of research. Now, I want to spend the rest of this session looking at how we can access these church records. Because this is such a major source, whether you're researching ancestors in the 1600s or the 1900s, church records are going to be of use to you. There are a lot of different organizations who have been busy adding church records online, and I want to take you through a few of those now. We This is our website, Ancestry Ireland. And as I said earlier, we transcribe church and civil records for counties Antrim and Down, including Belfast. We also make those records available on the Roots Ireland website. And this is the website of the Irish Family History Foundation, of which we are a member, and they have 
genealogy centers across the island of Ireland. Some of the big counties actually have two genealogy centers who are busy transcribing and indexing church records to make them available online through this website. We currently have over 23 million records. So if you haven't already looked at this website, I highly recommend it. It is a not-for-profit organization. So it's a subscription-based website, which allows us to continue the work. You can subscribe for a day, a month, six months, or a year. Um, if you haven't already um, accessed it, I always suggest you maybe subscribe for a day and turn off your phone, close the blinds, kind of blast your research. Because if we have already transcribed the church records um, from the church your ancestors attended, you can actually get quite a lot of record results really quite quickly. Just bear in mind, it's an ongoing project. We do not have records from every church yet. Even though we've been doing this for over 30 years now, there's still a lot of churches still to do. So it is a website worth revisiting every six months or a year. There is a newsletter. So you may want to submit, um, you may want to sign up to that. They they will email you just sporadically when a new series of records has gone online. So I think last week or a week and a half ago, they added thousands of Limerick records online. Um, and we're always working on new records. If you're interested in the annual subscription, for to mark St. Patrick's Day, we are offering 25% off our annual um, subscription to the end of the month. So we have records for every county in Ireland, although we don't have records for the city of Dublin, although we do for County Dublin or for a part of County Cork. Now, if you are interested in those areas, I'm going to show you another website that covers those areas in just a minute. You can also look at the sources list. So if you go to that top line and you go to online sources, you click on the county you're interested in and it will bring you up a list of the church records they have organized first by denomination and then by parish name. And you can see on this slide, we have the name of the parish, the dates that the records cover. I would always recommend you look at the sources list before you subscribe to make sure that the area you're interested in is covered and the time period is covered. It's very straightforward to search. You can put in the name that you're looking for. If you know the father's name, you can put that in. There is a box for the mother's name, but do play around with that box because we now know that the, even if you know the mother's name, the priest or minister might not have listed that in the baptismal record. You can narrow it down by time period. If there's a couple of counties you think you are, or, or uh, where your family come from, you can click on those. Or you can search the whole island of Ireland. And that's really helpful for those of you who don't yet know where your family come from, or if your family had a particular occupation that meant they moved around the country a lot. So that would include national school teachers. It would include policemen, coast guard, bank officials, railway officials. So there is reasons why some people may move about and you may therefore be able to search the whole island because you may find baptisms in different counties than you might expect. If you do know the town land, you can search just the county itself and you can put in the town land name. So that again is useful if you have quite a common surname. And then you get a full transcription of the record. We work very closely with the churches and we have permission by the churches to index and transcribe their records, but not to put a digital image online. And obviously we respect their, their um, wishes. We do transcribe everything in the record. So sometimes I get people emailing me saying, oh, I found this baptism of my ancestor, but you didn't include the mother's name. Can you send me it? Unfortunately, we don't leave anything out. So if the mother's name is not on the red, the transcription, it's because the priest or minister hasn't recorded it. What we do have done is we have linked in the Catholic records to the National Library site. I'm going to show you that in just a minute. So you see the little blue button at the bottom, view microfilm of parish register. So if you come across a Catholic record, you can click that and it will take you to the correct microfilm on the National Library's site. And then you would go to filter events and you would choose baptism, marriage or or a funeral, and then you would drill down by year and by month, and it will take you to the correct page so that you can look at the original yourself. And we always recommend you look at the originals where they are available. Now, this is a wonderful website. It's a free website. 
Um, the National Library of Ireland down in Dublin, they microfilmed Catholic parish registers up to 1880. That's the cutoff date for this project in the mid 20th century. And then a few years ago, they announced they were going to digitize them. Well, I thought mm, it's yet another step away from the original. But actually, they have done a wonderful job. It is much easier to look at these registers than it ever was on microfilm. You used to have to go to Dublin, go to the National Library and look through them manually um, on the microfilm readers. And now you can access them from home for free. If you know the parish, you can put it in there or you can search the map. And if you click into that, it shows the whole island of Ireland there at the top left. And then if you click on a particular county, it brings it down and you can see the names of the Catholic parishes there. I find this really helpful, this map, because you can see, if you can just about make out, there's a few dashed lines and that's where a parish actually crosses the county boundary. And that's really useful because although your ancestor may be living in one county, the bulk of that parish may be in a neighbouring county and it's in that county that you'll find the records for example on Roots Island so it's really useful to have this map and then in Belfast and Dublin there in the bottom left they've actually mapped where the Catholic churches are in those cities so again that helps you with the geography. Now like I say if you know the parish you can go straight there but it isn't in text or transcribed on this website you're just accessing the original registers so unless you know a specific time a specific year you're going to be look, having to look through the whole parish register. So that's why we would encourage you to start by looking at Roots Island and then move to this when you find the actual record on Roots Island you're interested in. Ancestry and Find My Past have also indexed these records. One of the other challenges with this is if it, the handwriting isn't hard enough sometimes is that some Catholic registers will be in Latin. And that tended to be in areas where Gaelic was the main language and the priest maybe didn't speak or write English or certainly not enough for him to feel confident about writing the registers in English. Latin was the official language of the Catholic Church. Now, don't be too put off if you find this. In general, the surnames remain the same. It's the first names they tend to change into Latin and then any phrases. If you come across it, you're still searching the register for your surname. And then when you find your surname, then you can begin to try and interpret it. If you go to the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland, Prunies website, and this is a free website, this is in your handout, nidirect.gov.uk forward slash Pruny, and you go down, this is the homepage, you go down to the Your Research button there on the bottom right, and then you click on Information Leaflets, and then you click on General Information Series. We have produced a help sheet titled Latin Terminology in Catholic Registers, on the first side of the page, it's all the main phrases and what they mean. On the other side of the page, we have written the most common first names used in that period. They're Latin and they're English. So it's a really useful page to look at. In many cases, the Latin first name looks very like the English one. It just has tends to have an IUS or something on the end. But in some cases, it can be quite different. So for example, um, James is like Jacobus in Latin. And if you read that, not knowing, you would think that's Jacob, understandably. So there's a few names that can catch you out. And that's why this little help sheet is well worth downloading. Now, I mentioned that there's a few areas of Ireland that Roots Island doesn't cover. And then we're back to that Irish genealogy that we looked at at the start when we looked at civil records. They also have church records on this. And again, this is a free website. It's quite straightforward to search. Again, you can put in the location if you know it. They have church records for counties Carlow, Cork, Kerry, and Dublin City. Um, at the minute, Church of Ireland and Catholic. They don't have every church record on there yet, but if those four places are places you're interested in researching, just make sure you remember that website. You get a list of results, a little index page, and you can see you can narrow it down by area, by time period. And then sometimes when you click through, you get a transcription, but sometimes when you click through, you get a lovely digitized image 
of that page. And this, I think this is amazing. I think this is St. Nicholas's Church of Ireland in the city of Dublin from 1663. And you can sit at home and look at this register from Dublin City in 1663 for free. And even though it's quite flowery, it actually is quite straightforward to read. And then we have the representative church body library. Now this it's quite a mouthful, but it's actually the official archive of the Church of Ireland, and it's based on the outskirts of Dublin. They have started to digitize a few of their registers through this website. Only 28 at the minute, and mostly from kind of Ross Common and Wexford, a few from Armagh. But they have recently been given a grant of €100,000 from the Irish government in order to start digitizing more of these parish registers so we are expecting to see more church violin registers go online through the rcb library in forthcoming years mostly from the south of ireland um, because pruny um, hold a lot from the north now the rcb library has this great catalog of church violin records for the whole island of ireland they update it once a year and it's color coded so, for example, yellow means that the records are held in the RCB library in Dublin. Purple means they're held in Pruny in Belfast. Green means that they were lost in a fire, but copies have been found in one of the other archives. Gray means they were lost in the fire and there are no copies. White means they're in local custody. And turquoise means they're in the National Archives in Dublin. So the one you really don't want is the gray. Now, when I was looking at this uh, catalog a few months ago, I came across Abba Vale in County Limerick. Do you see it's highlighted green there? Well, when I looked at this catalogue last year, it was grey. So last year, this parish register was lost. And somehow in the last 12 months, they have found the registers or they have realised that the registers were there and it's now green. So copies have been found in an archive. And I must contact RCB Library to find out a bit more about this story. Now, we're not going to find every register that was destroyed in the fire, but this really gives me hope. And it's why it's always worth revisiting all the websites that we are showing you, because sometimes something may be discovered and may be the thing that you're looking for. Now, I wanted to just touch briefly on the IGP. This is a voluntary transcription project for church records. Uh, I wanted to highlight Fermanagh because I know Fermanagh doesn't there's not a lot of Fermanagh record, church records online on any of those other websites. Um, and the volunteers have been transcribing Church of Ireland, Methodist, all different kind of denominations listed here. You can click into them and then it brings up this typed um, version of the whole register. So you would just need to use Control F on your computer to find a, a surname within this register. And do remember that some community groups, some churches themselves, have actually transcribed, indexed, sometimes even digitized their own church records. So it's always worth Googling um, the church you think your family belong to and just see what's available out there. That's just a few examples. Now, once you've worked your way through all those church records, always then go to the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland. And this is the homepage. And on it, you will find this guide to church records. Now, it is 374 pages, so you might not want to print it out, but you can download it onto your computer or you can access it through their website. And as Finton showed you earlier, it's organized by civil parish, and then within the parish, it's organized by denomination. So we have here Church of Ireland, Methodist, Presbyterian, the Roman Catholic ones just on the next page. We have the name of the church, we have the dates that the records cover, and then we have the references or is it in Prune? Then we have the reference. Is it in a different archive, Presbyterian Historical Society, for example, or it might be in local custody? Um, and quite often people say to me, is it worth contacting the church themselves? Now, some churches, if they've made a copy of the register available through an archive, they will expect you to access the records through that archive. But I always think it's worth contacting the church because you just don't know the response. Do bear in mind that a lot of churches, like all over the world, there's fewer people going into ordination. So a lot of clergy nowadays have responsibility for two or more parishes or two or more churches. And obviously their first priority has to be pastoral care. A lot of them don't really have that many staff and the staff may be voluntary and again, may be busy organizing church life. 
so they may not be able to deal with genealogical queries. On the other hand, some people, clients I've worked with have written to the church and got a really great response in terms of somebody was able to look through the registers for them. So do contact them, do Google them, see if they have an email address. Most churches will have an email address or a Facebook page um, nowadays, or at least an address for you to write a letter to. If you're planning a trip to Ireland, do always make contact with the church beforehand because nowadays churches are not open all day. If you haven't been able to make contact with anyone, they haven't responded to you, if you can go on a Sunday at the time of the service, because then at least you're sure to get inside the church and you won't be at the door <laughs> trying to get in. If you can um, and you're at a Sunday service, do go a bit earlier or stay a bit later, get chatting to people. Usually there's somebody in the parish, in the congregation, who is the kind of expert in the records or knows every plot in the graveyard and you want to be introduced to that person. So being able to chat to people um, beforehand and often that knowledgeable person is not the actual clergy person. It's somebody else who's been in the parish in the congregation for a really long time. So if you are planning a visit, that's a really good avenue to pursue, but do try and make contact with them beforehand. Um, the National Archives down in Dublin have microfilms of some of those Church of Ireland records, mostly for the South. And there is also the Presbyterian Historical Society of Ireland, which is based in Belfast, but covers the whole island of Ireland. Um, and they have excellent records, including some church registers that are not available anywhere else. Um, so if you have any prominent Presbyterians, either here or back in Ireland, especially ministers, um, it's well worth contacting that organization because they may have a lot of papers um, to do with the Presbyterian church and particular individuals within it. So those are the baptisms, marriages and burials. Those are the ones that are being put online. However, there are all those lesser known administrative records within church collections. And I just wanted to finish this session before we go to another short break, um, just highlighting a few of those. For those of you who have already explored church registers and you've either gone back as far as you can or you've encountered some gaps in the registers. First of all, some of these records can push you back further. Sometimes they will help plug gaps in the baptisms, marriages, and burials. There's three minute books. You find these within the Church of Ireland. And um, the Church of Ireland had responsibility for a lot of local community events like taking care of poor, taking care of uh, orphaned or foundling children, um, taking the repair of minor roads and bridges. So the great thing about Vestry Minute Books is they include names for all members of the parish, not just people who were Church of Ireland. So if, you're, if your ancestor provided a service to the parish, they might have been paid through the Vestry Minute Books and you'll see their name there, and they do not have to be attending the Church of Ireland on Sunday. Session minute books are found within the Presbyterian Church. These tend to be only about members of the congregation. They can be quite dry. Any minute book can be quite dry. And of course, they haven't been indexed or transcribed. So I don't recommend you start with minute books, but it is something just to keep in the back of your head if you've explored everything else. Now, I did say minute books can be dry. Um, within the Presbyterian Church, if you sinned, you had to publicly repent in front of the congregation before you could take communion again. And in the minute books, your sin was recorded. So sometimes you might find more than you want to know about your ancestors. Uh, it's quite personal detail, shall we say. Um, you also may find confirmation records. Again, they tend to be within the Church of Ireland. But uh, if there's a gap in baptismal records, most children were confirmed between 13 and 16 in the Church of Ireland. So that, again, can plug a little gap in the baptismal record. Communicant lists you find within the Presbyterian Church, and again, they had to be a young adult before they could start taking communion, and some ministers actually kept a little record of what, what happened when they died, if they emigrated, so it can be quite useful. Some ministers would have kept parish or congregational census, sadly not as many as I would like. But again, they can be a really useful source. Now, there's lots more administrative records that we're not going to have time to look at today, but I just wanted to highlight that as another source for you. Now, I very much and we very much like to focus on online resources that you can access from home, particularly free ones. Um, 
But as you can see with those administrative records, those are not online yet. Those are in the archives. So something to look at if any of you are planning a trip to Ireland. But if you're not in a position to plan a trip to Ireland, then I just wanted to highlight that the Ulster Historical Foundation has a range of research services, um, which is the side of the work that I manage. And we would be, be delighted to do some work for you, whether that's looking through a particular baptismal register for you or more in-depth research, or you just have one document, you just want us to go to the archive archives and photocopy or photograph for you. We'd be delighted to do that. That archival work is only for the North of Ireland because we're based in the North of Ireland. We do work with genealogists in Dublin and we can certainly recommend you a genealogist, genealogist in Dublin if it's Dublin archives you'd like to look at. We also offer um, initial assessments, which are like feasibility studies. If you've hit a brick wall or you're not sure where to go next, we'll assess the information and produce the report that we'll email to you. Or we can do a consultation either in person in our offices in Ireland or on Zoom. And again, that's really useful if you just would like some personalized advice. And those consultations and research assessments cover the whole island of Ireland. So I just want to leave that now and we're going to take a 10 minute break and then Fenton will come back with the final presentation before we do our Q&A. Thank you all very much. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna resume, folks. If you want to take your seat and get settled, and we're gonna do this last presentation, and then we'll have a Q and A question and answer session. Um, and the other thing I was gonna just say to those in the room, um, we did uh, we didn't think we had any of these brochures, but we we found them in a box, so we have left them out on your chair. Uh, if you haven't got one, please come up at the end of the day and get one. Do, do you need one? Yeah. Um, well, that's good. That's good. That's good. But also background material that we've been talking about today. But of course, the me, the most of the stuff is all on. <coughs> most of the stuff is all on your uh, electronic handouts that Scott and the team here would have forwarded on to you. Okay. In this last presentation of this morning, we're going to be looking. Uh, at early sources, sources relating to the 17th century and around the Ulster plantation. Okay. Uh, now, you will have, in the breaks, you would have had a chance to browse. We actually, when it comes to this subject of 17th century Irish history and guides to available sources, there really is an embarrassment of riches uh, that you could avail of for this period. There's so much published about it. It's such an interesting period. It's a crucial period in our history. It's a century when Ireland changed forever. Uh, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, and so much has been written about it. And we, our organization, the foundation, has published quite a lot. I'm not going to go through these in detail, but just to name check some of these things for you. If you're interested in the County of Londonderry, I mentioned earlier, that's a one uh, volume study of the Londonderry plantation, very valuable. This uh, colonial Ulster looks at the plantation in Antrim and Down, because as we'll see, Antrim and Down were not part of the official plantation scheme. This explores the Ulster Rising of 1641 and the decade of warfare that followed. This is a collection of essays on uh, 17th century history, predicting good for Donegal and Fermanagh if you're interested, by one of the most highly respected historians of Ulster 17th century history, Bob Hunter, R.J. Hunter. That, uh, the Ulster Plantation in Armagh and Cavan, was, uh, it's based on his thesis that he submitted for a uh, degree of PhD. Here we've got the uh, 1641 depositions. I'll come back to these in the presentation. These are witness statements taken at the time of the rising in Ireland in 1641. So many atrocities were committed in the in Ireland in this decade, and these depositions record losses that families suffered. This is a copy of the muster roll of 1630-31, which is one of the most important genealogical sources we have for Ireland in the 17th century. And we've actually got copies available over here on the table. It's normally priced $20, but we've re reduced it, and you can purchase this for $15 uh, today, if you're interested in that book. That Scottish migration, the Ulster, also on the table, looks at the migration in the early period, particularly in Antrim and Down. Uh, this Catholic community, Gillian mentioned already, is by Patrick Corish, a uh, noted historian of Irish Catholic history. And he looks at the um, 
the fortunes of the Catholic community in the 17th and 18th century, having suffered so much under the penal legislation. And this last one is just an account of the uh, 1641 rising in part of Cavan, where this gentleman, he actually was one of the commissioners of inquiry that gathered these uh, depositions for the government at the time. So there's a wealth of material that we have and more that we can find. In your uh, links to the handouts that you will have received, uh, not the main handout, but in the drop, it's not a Dropbox link, it's some other type of link, um, you will actually find copies for some of our plantation resources that are in there for free as well. Now, this is a genealogy presentation, not a history talk, but just to give you a little bit of background timeline to the 17th century. As I say, it's a century where Ireland changed forever. And you could really see the change wrought on the landscape as well. So we start with the coming to the end of the Nine Years' War. The Ulster Chiefs, O'Neill, O'Donnell, and all these men had fought Elizabeth, Elizabeth I, the last Tudor monarch, to pretty much a standstill. But eventually the English won through and they won that war. And peace was signed at the Treaty of Mellifont in 1603, just after just shortly after Elizabeth died. So the new king, James I or James VI of Scotland, signs this peace with the Irish lords. These guys who started this Nine Years' War, it was a fairly generous treaty from their point of view, but they couldn't really adjust to the new circumstances they were in. So within a very small number of years, they actually left in the flight of the earls, you probably heard tell of that, they left from Rathmullen in Loch Swilly and went to Europe with the intention of getting support from a Catholic cause, for example, the Catholic king in Spain, to come back and retake their lands from the English. But that never happened. The Catholic king in Spain already had his fingers burned, remember, with the Spanish Armada in 1588. So they did not get support. And O'Neill died a broken man in Rome in about 1616, never having returned. And that dream of the Irish that O'Neill would come back and take back the lands was never realised. That act of leaving to go to Europe was considered a further act of betrayal, of, of treason, because they were going to try and raise an army. So their lands were confiscated in the entirety. These were called the escheated lands. Lands were confiscated. And these were the lands that the government decided they were going to be planted by loyal Protestant subjects from England and Scotland. That was the point of the plantation of Ulster. So plantation, it's a, it's a violent act. They're planting people in the Ulster to replace the natives. So they're pushing the natives off the land that they held prior to this. Many native Irish lose their land in this time. Those that didn't lose their land, known as the deserving Irish, uh, often received less land they had held prior to this plantation period and maybe were given lands in more marginal areas. So there's massive confiscation and redistribution of land right at the start of this century. So we have this plantation of Ulster beginning in about 1609 through to 1611. It's organised from London, so it's properly planned for by the Crown, and therefore there is documentation and really good maps. We have some wonderful maps from the early period because they undertook surveys of the lands that were going to be planted. These Bodley maps, Josias Bodley was the man who went to Ulster to uh, <coughs> um, plant or to, to prepare for the plantation. One of the early mappers in Ulster, Bartlett, actually lost his head to the native Irish when he was trying to map the country. Uh, the, ma the Irish decided they did not want an Englishman to know their lands, so off with the head. Uh, but we have these wonderful maps from this early period. And we have the beginning of this plantation process. Now, it moves slowly. The government's never happy with the way it is developing. The County of Londonderry, for example, the London companies, the old guilds, like, you know, the goldsmiths or the merchant tailors or the fishmongers, et cetera, they all got lands in this new county, Londonderry. It was managed for them by the Honourable, the Irish Society created by them to manage their affairs. The Irish Society still exists still based in Coleraine today, 400 years later. Uh, and early on, even in, in Londonderry, the plantation code was not being followed, that the London companies were letting native Irish back onto the lands again where they were not supposed to be because there were areas of Scottish influence, areas of Irish influence, sorry, English influence, and areas where the Irish were to be settled. So we have a slow start and it's not going well and the Crown's not happy. So they undertake these surveys into the progress of the plantation, which gives us documentation as well. There's that seething resentment of the Irish underneath this 
bubbling away and that erupts in 1641 when there is a rising for the natives in the north and this spreads to the whole island. It leads a Scottish-led, not exclusively, but Scottish-led army to come to Ulster in 1641-42. That's when they bring Presbyterianism. Gillian mentioned 1613, but it's the army coming into Ireland in the 1640s that really brings Presbyterian in a strong way into Ulster. And we see the church developing and spreading across the northern part of the island from this. A decade of warfare, warfare ensues. Cromwell comes to Ireland in 1649 and puts it down brutally with the sword. You've probably heard of, you know, the massacres at places like Drogheda and Wexford. And he says, I will send the Irish to hell or Connacht. And they do indeed draw plans and they move the Irish in many instances west of the River Shannon, plant it, replant it into uh, territories in Connacht. So your ancestors may have moved that time. After Cromwell dies, then the Commonwealth really runs into the sand. And so they decide to bring back the king. Charles II is restored, sympathetic to the Catholic cause. And so the Irish, who were native, old Catholic families, uh, native Irish and old English families who were loyal to the crown and loyal to the old Catholic faith, they expect that they're maybe going to be treated better under Charles doesn't really materialise. They don't really get the lands back that they had hoped because Cromwell oversees this massive confiscation of more land across the island. So not just Ulster now, across the island. And so Charles really doesn't follow through on what people had hoped. But his brother, who James is openly Catholic, and he does want to upset the city and order of things, but tries to go too far too soon. And the English won't have this, the glorious revolution. They install his son-in-law and his daughter. Remember, Mary, who marries William III, is actually James's daughter. Uh, and he is deposed. He flees. He goes back to Ireland. He raises an army. And then, of course, we have the Williamite Wars in Ireland, the Siege of Derry that you probably will know of, the Battle of the Boyne, Battle of Ockram, and then the Battle of Limerick and the Treaty of Limerick, where William wants a fairly generous peace to be conveyed to the Irish, but the Episcopal Parliament in Dublin, Anglican, almost exclusively Anglican, Church of Ireland, they pass these penal laws which punish the Catholics and the Presbyterians and builds up a further store of resentment amongst the Presbyterians that encourages them to start migrating very early, from as early as 1718, they're coming to America because they can't live under the order that the Episcopal Parliament has imposed. So we have a decade, or sorry, a century of warfare, upheaval, confiscation of land. So you think, how would you trace ancestors in that? But actually, there's lots of documentation that exists. You see it physically changed, because at 1600, Ireland's covered in woods, big oak forests. By 1700, it's no longer covered in these great forests. We have towns and villages and roads all across the north, and indeed in the south as a result of the English plantation. The whole point of it is to settle this most rule, unruly, wild, Gaelic, lawless province to bring English ways and English laws to this country. So it physically changes the landscape. So just to start looking at the sources, we have maps, really good maps available from this early period, which are digitized and available from some locations. For example, this is the Flickr account of the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland. So if you go to the Prony website, then look for their Flickr account. You can find barony maps of the escheated counties. You can see them listed here. So the baronies, and then you can see broken down into what we would call now parishes and townlands. And we're going to look at sources from this earliest period. A source called the Irish Faints of the Tudor Sovereigns. Um, and these originals, and in many cases, the records I'm talking about here this morning, were destroyed in the Four Courts Fire in 1922 that Gillian mentioned. But we are fortunate because copies or extracts or summaries of these documents were often made long before the Four Courts Fire. Point for you to remember in your research, if you're new to Irish research, that even though a record may seem on the face of it to be destroyed, somebody may have made a copy of that record years before in the old public record office and may have published that in an old book. And that's the way sometimes you can get access to so much of this content. These feints of the Tudor sovereigns actually were published in summary form in the appendices to the deputy keeper's reports. This is the deputy keeper's reports we're looking at on the shelves at Prony. And you can see these larger volumes here of these deputy keeper's reports where they published in their entirety a collection of records that interested them greatly at the time, so maybe 1870s, 1880s, and included 
in a series of appendices were these feints of the Tudor sovereign. Pardons mainly, but sometimes also maybe a conferment by the king on a, an, subject, an individual for and reward, reward for some service that they had given, or maybe a, a little sinecure, a little job that they were handed, a nice cushy little number, as we would say back in Ireland. But many of them are pardons to the native Irish, and they are from the 16th century, the 1500s, from the reign of Henry right through to the reign of Elizabeth. Um, some of them, as you can see here, run to many pages. So these Irishmen who were given these pardons didn't just list themselves and their wife and sons, they listed their whole household, everybody associated with them, you know, all their servants, people who worked their farmlands, people who were their, um, you know, their soldiers, the, the men that guarded the uh, chief. Everybody, in some cases, gets listed. Some of these pardons run to several pages. One, number 6539, runs to nearly six pages. You can see an example of how dense the, the type is there. And because this is 16th century Ireland, these are attempts by English clerks, scribes, to record Gaelic names. So we've got a sort of a mangled version of an old Gaelic name. And often these Gaelic names are double and triple barreled. So that maybe, you know, John O'Connor McGrath McMullen, which is a little mini genealogy in itself. If you remember, Mac means son of, and O is grandson or descendant of. So there's actually a little clue in the names in these feints. The originals, I say, were destroyed, but um, the record commissioners working in, I think, 1820s, 1830s, uh, <coughs> sorry, wrong one. These were actually published as summary form by the um, the record office, the, the deputy keepers staff in the 1870s, 1880s, in these series of appendices, published in four volumes in the 1990s, but you'll be pleased to hear now available online, accessible via digitized version of those old deputy keepers reports. So as I showed you there, some of them can be very long. They don't just list the Irish, even though they're 16th century. We have, in here, have here a pardon to a Donald McOnee of Belachmon. You see there's the townland, a very early version of the townland name, County Kildare, Captain of the Galloglass, Scott of Curran. So Galloglass are mercenary soldiers. Often they were Scottish mercenary soldiers working, fighting in Ireland, often fighting for some Irish chief in a local squabble, one Irish chief against another. So soldiers of fortune coming to Ireland. And that's an example of this Donald Mick O'Neill there. The Scott of Curran, of course, in Latin, indicating that he is actually a Scottish soldier. Or another example, grant of English liberty to Pierre or Peter Perrin, uh, or Peter Trimlett, French travelling smiths in the late 16th century. Now, they can relate to some great landed families. For example, pardon to John O'Neill, otherwise called Shane uh, Dulloch O'Neill, son of Con, Earl of Tyrone. Well, that's the uh, actual one of the major O'Neills. Part of this whole policy, why, these, why do we have these pardons? Um, the Tudor sovereigns encouraged this policy of surrender and regrant, so they would make the Irish chiefs acknowledge their overlordship uh, and they would be pardoned for some misdemeanor. And then the Irish chief would be regranted his lands and title under English law rather than holding it under the old Brehan Irish law. So the McCarthy Moore or that O'Neill maybe would become the Earl of Tyrone as a result of this exorcism and would be acknowledging the king as his superior in this respect. So we see some of the great and the good, but we also see ordinary individuals. We can see up here um, Richard Reid of Dublin Baker for the accidental death of Robert Casey. Um, William Stubbs of Dublin Shoemaker. These are not rich men. Pardon to John O'Dwyle of uh, Doyle of Drummond, County Carlow, and Gerald McTurlock O'Dwyle, you see a little double barrel name there, of saying, condemned at the Assizes in Waxford to the robbery of certain cows, sheep, and garrons, to Lachlan Doyle in the prison of the Castle of Dublin, condemned for robbery, and so on. So sometimes in these feints, which run to many volumes, they are listing ordinary individuals. And as I say, you can access these for free via the Hathi Trust, where these have been made available via the digitization of the original books themselves, the deputy keepers reports. So here's an example of them. So we have them going all the way back to Henry, Edward VI, Philip and Mary, and then of course, Elizabeth. And because of the length of Elizabeth's reign, there's so many of them. You will also notice within this as well, um, the archaic version of the spellings of your townland or parish name. So that's something to be bear in, ma bear in mind. Like in the area where I'm from, back here in the early 1600s, there basically have just appended the word 
Bally to every place name. So Bally Port of Ferry, Bally Carrig, Bally Derry. Well, they would just be Port of Ferry, Carrig, and Derry now. But for some reason, the English scribe has appended Bally, place of settlement of town or townland of, comes from the old word Bolia. So it, uh, it could mean different things in different contexts. So just be mindful of that when you're looking at 17th century sources. So those Tudor <laughs> themes take us to about 1603. But then we have these calendar of patent rules of James I. These originals were destroyed too, but summaries had been made of them by the record commissioners in the 1820s or 1830s. And it was reissued again by the Irish Manuscripts Commission some years ago, and they produced an index to these works. So these patent rules are, again, uh, awards or pardons by the king to individuals in Ireland. It's a huge volume running to about 600 pages of about double or triple columned as well, listed many individuals in it. And included within these patent rules of James I are a specific subgroup of records called the Grants of Denization and Naturalization. So while the crowns were united under James I of Scotland, or uh, of England and Ireland, uh, James VI of Scotland, the jurisdictions weren't united until 1707. That's when we had the Act of Union between Scotland and England. So a Scot coming into Ulster at this time, if you like, in modern parlance, was an alien. And he would need if he wanted to sort of enjoy all the rights and privileges, he would need to take out an act or sorry, a grant of denization or naturalization. And so these grants of denization were extracted by Reverend David Stewart in the late 1940s and published in this book, The Scots and Ulster, Their Denization and Naturalization. There's the names of just over a thousand individuals listed in these, all Scots. So those of you who are interested in Scots Irish ancestors, that's a good source to look at these grants of denization. They're available as a database on our website for our members. So if you're a member of the foundation, you can gain access to them. And what makes them so useful is they list these individuals and where in Ulster they have settled. And you can see in many instances, they are for a very early period of time, 1616 or 1617 and so on here. Also in a very few cases, not many, maybe about a dozen, certainly I don't think much more than that, they actually do give a place in Scotland where that individual comes from. Now, that is really rare. You just, a couple of people already have asked at the break about that, about is there any documentation between Ulster and Scotland and that movement of Scots into our, there's not, so close, 12 miles apart at their narrowest point, and the sea was a, wasn't a barrier, the sea was a bridge. They went back and forward for millennia across this strait. So there's no documentation on that. I did say to one gentleman, one of the things to do if you're looking for a Scot or an English person in Ulster in the 17th century, look for detail about his landlord in Ireland, because he almost certainly was under that same landlord in England or Scotland, because these great landlords took lands in Ireland and encouraged their tenants to settle on their estates. So look, if you've got a Scot in Ulster, whose estate is he on? Does that estate owner have lands back in Scotland? Just to show you that denization in action here, why they would take it out. This is a, a grant of such from these patent rolls. Grant to Robert Hamilton, and you can see a whole list of Scottish names, all being of the Scotch nation or descent, to be free from the yoke or Scots of Scotch or Irish servitude, and to enjoy all the rights and privileges of English subjects. So that's why they took these grants of denization. And also was a clue fairly strong clue that they intended to stay. Why would they go to the trouble of taking a grant of denization if they weren't planning on staying? Now, the whole idea of plantation was to settle this country, establish towns, establish markets, establish courts where law could be administered and law could be administered locally by the new landlords coming in. So from a very early period, we have some court records. They're not very extensive. The originals were burned, of course, in 1922, but summaries of some of the information have survived. You can see we're looking at a little transcript here, typescript copy, made before the Four Courts fire, the records subsequently burned. And what makes them interesting is this is for sort of low-lying offences, uh, uh, you know, very simple misdemeanors. So you could quite easily find your ancestor listed in a source like this. And crucially as well, and this is another point to remember about a lot of these sources, like those uh, 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 faints of the Tudor sovereigns or some of the patent rules, not the denizations, because they're deliber deliberately and specifically for the Scots. But in these records from this period, you can see the planter, the English and the Scot, as well as the native Irish in these sources. It's not one community or the other. 
So we have, for example, Thomas Thompson of Kilskiri is fined for selling whiskey and wine without a license, quite a common one. Uh, Eleanor Papp, fined for Sabbath breaking. Isabel Mills, fined for keeping a noisy house at midnight. We bit of a shebeen going on there in her place. Here's another example. Now these, Gillian mentioned to you at the, the start about this virtual treasury that was created in the past few years to sort of recreate what the old public record office was like on the eve of the fire in 1922. And where they have been able to gather together records or samples of records, they have done so. So here's an example where we can actually see these summonister roles on this virtual, tre virtual treasury website. So you could go and access these today. You wouldn't have to go and use Prony to see these. And we have examples here. Uh, just again, reinforcing that it's everybody and anybody could show up in these sorts of records. Pat Motor O'Gormley, that's a native Irishman of Cappy, appeared to stand his trial for stealing five cows from Alexander Stewart. Well, Alexander Stewart could probably be a Scots settler. Arthur Leigh Bart, Baronet, is that, uh, fined £15 at the Assizes as he was paid for building a bridge across the river of Oma, which he has not done. So he's quite well off individual. He's been found there. And then we've got Thomas Windsor Esquire and his wife, Christina, Edward Ellis, gentleman, and his wife, Anne. So, you know, some well-to-do individuals, but husband and wife listed together. <laughs> now, we have useful documentation from this period of time, which gives the names of the actual landlords who settled the lands. Now, some of them did not stay. They sold out quickly. Some of them never even visited to take up their lands. They sold on quickly, but others did. And in this book, Reverend George Hill's Plantation of Ulster, we can see the grants of land to the big landlords, the undertakers. They undertook to plant the land. We can see these individuals listed in Hill's book, Plantations, uh, Plantation in Ulster. Here we're looking at, in this spread, natives. So we're getting the native Irish, the deserving Irish, the mere Irish, as we're called. Um, they were being granted lands in the plantation, under the plantation process. We also have these surveys into the progress of the plantation, which can be useful. Now, it is fair to say that in most cases, they are concerning themselves with the person who owns the land, not our tenant farmer ancestors who are leasing the land. Nonetheless, they are worth consulting. There is Nicholas Pinner's survey of 1618-19, which is actually published in a book by Hill and a historical account of the plantation of Ulster, et cetera, et cetera, available from archive.org. So you can get access to this and actually the previous book example from archive.org. So get that free. And we have here the information on the estate holder the lands that they have, you can see 750 acres, 1,000 acres, etc. And it may give some detail about that estate, but they don't give much information that will take you down to the individual tenant farmers. However, a much more useful survey, especially for Armagh and County Tyrone, is the Irish Commission of 1622, published by the IMC, the Irish Manuscripts Commission, some years ago. Um, it is for some individuals, useful because it does give interesting detail about the estate owner's lands. So here we have a undertaker's certificate for so a piece of written evidence that the landlord gave to the commissioners when they visited for William Brownlow in County Armagh. So it's Lurgan, the town of Lurgan in County Armagh. And here we do have listing of his tenants in this 1622 commission, given their background occupation and giving detail about the nature of their tenure, i.e. how they are holding the lands. May have been on a lease for 21 or 31 years, but could have been a lease for lives. So three lives named in a lease. When the last life died, that was named, could be anybody, by the way, it didn't have to be any specific person. When that life, last life died, then the lease was due for renewal, so it had to be renegotiated or you would have to pay a renewal fine to add a new name to the lease. And they are very common in the 18th century, which is really a wonderful source for 18th century research. Here in Oma, in the English area, uh, we have a more information on tenants on this estate. And you can see a number of them are Scots. For example, John McCowan, a red shank. Donald Robinson, a red shank. You know, red shank as in red here. You know, you like to wear a kilt. Uh, and no barefoot and going through 
you know, long grass in cold weather uh, and your legs go red. So that's why they're called red shank. Um, so they're Scots, clearly. And then we've got uh, Cormac O'Conn, an Irishman that goes to church. And we have several of these. Hugh O'Devenon, an Irishman who goes to church. Uh, William Powell, John Me, an Irishman who goes to church. John Mingus, an Irishman who goes to church. You think, why are they always... Why are they saying this? Because these people probably have conformed to the Protestant faith. They're native Irish, they're Gaelic, Catholic, probably, and they're indicating that they have conformed their taken communion in the Protestant Episcopal Church here, which is, is in itself of interest. So that 1622 commission available from IMC is a very interesting resource. There are some other surveys of this period. For example, the Strafford, Strafford Inquisition, which is thought to date from the middle 1630s, was published by the Irish Manuscripts Commission some years ago, quite a few years ago. Unfortunately, it's not yet available as a digital book, uh, so you would need to uh, find access via a good research library and special collections, I imagine. This concerns the county of Mayo, so the Western province. And again, we've got detail on land holding. Moiler Malad, so that's the person's name, he has half a knee of Karen Sheena, Sheena Karen Sheena, um, that word nave is an old archaic term for a land division in Ireland. These all were discarded in the, certainly they were gone by the 1820s. Um, and everything now is just called a townland. But we find these old archaic land divisions in 17th century documents like nave or cartron, ballybo, bollybo, cowland uh, is from the Irish you will see them used in these land survey records. So this is a survey of land holding. Many native Irish have land here in the 17th century, of course. Another example here, the gross survey from County Galway, published in IMC's uh, journal, Analecta Hibernica, unavailable on JSTOR, so you could access this for free. And again, we've got land holding in County Galway, so Teague Kelly, person's name, uh, and it gives detail of his land holding there. So again, individuals who in this case are native Irish who are holding land at this point in time. And there are some estate records available for the 17th century, not only the 18th century where we always recommend, but some for the 17th century. For example, rentals or lease books. So here we have a rental for the O'Hara estate in County Sligo, 1666. It is not easy to read, as you can see, uh, a 17th century hand can be quite difficult to read. That is held in the National Library of Ireland, and one would find detail about that from the National Library's catalogue, which actually has just changed within the last two weeks. National Library have updated their website. There's not a massive body of material, but there, if you check for the county that you're interested in across the island of Ireland, not just Ulster, of course, because that Sligo is obviously outside of Ulster, you may find some details about land holding, i.e. tenant farmers, in 17th century Ireland for the locations you're interested in. Here's, for example, an abstract from the rentals of the Archbishop of Armagh from 1615 through to 1746, held by Armagh County Museum, and digitized and available from this website. So here we have the listing of the names extracted from a rent roll for Armagh 1615. And the land that the Archbishop of Armagh was a very large landowner. Uh, he had lands not just in his own diocese, but in other locations. Here's another example, the rental of the Balfour Estate in County Fermanagh in 1636, so very early. And that is available uh, on a free publication that you're welcome to download from this location. That ha that URL should be in your handout. Um, but if you can't find it, just go to Prony website and Google Plantations of Ulster by R.J. Hunter, and you should be able to find it. It looks like this. This is what the front cover of the book looks like. And it is a collection of 30 documents from the 17th century, including that rental, which would allow you, if you're interested in the subject, allow you to read around and find out a bit more about land holding in Ulster in this early 17th century. Sometimes the hard work's been done for you, and individuals have actually extracted the names from rentals or as lease books and published them. So, for example, we have here tenants on the estates of the Earls of Antrim in the 17th century. <laughs> the Earl of Antrim was an interesting individual, Randall MacDonald. He was a Scottish Catholic, a friend of the King, and he was given the largest estate in Ireland in 1603, or sorry, in Ulster in 1603, an estate running to several hundred thousand acres, 
if you believe. A very large part of County Antrim was gifted to the Scottish Catholic by the King on condition that he would encourage lowland Scots Protestants to settle, which he did. He built churches to settle in there despite being a very devout Catholic himself. And we see details here of the tenants on his estate in the 17th century. We have, for example, the Agnews, etc., who could well be Scottish, but they might be Irish and even like that. Um, you would see McAllister, they're definitely, all of McAllister are definitely Scotch. But if you come down here, these Brian Boy Macaulay, Brian Old Macaulay, Donald Drum Macaulay, those are clearly native Irish, Gaelic, Catholic Irish tenants on the Earls of Antrim's estate. So just as I've said already, you may find details of your Catholic Irish ancestor in some of these records, as well as the planters. Now, the most important source for the planter community for the early 17th century is the muster roll of 1630-31. Seeing that the men were mustered and armed and ready to defend the community was one of the conditions of the plantation that the landlords were supposed to follow, and they did not. They repeatedly failed to do so. So at the end of the 1620s, the government sent the muster master general around to undertake a complete muster of the men in the planted lands in Ulster. And we have this muster roll as a result. It runs to over 13,000 names. So it's the most comprehensive head of household uh, survey we have of the planter community in Ireland in the 17th century. Really essential if you've got a Scottish or English uh, ancestor who was in Ireland at this time. It lists the individuals by county, by barony, and then by the estate uh, in which they were a tenant, and it will give information on any arms they had. So maybe a gun like a snap hunts or something like that may be recorded against them, sword, or even no weapons. So it's an interesting snapshot of the whole planter community, not just one section of it. And so all able-bodied men over the ages of 16 were to be mustered. Now, you would think the source like this is only for Scottish or English Protestant settlers, but if we look at this entry here, we see that it concerns Patrick Sheehan, and it says beside his name that he's a papist. So he may be the only Catholic in that source of 13,000 years, but he is there. So the point we would make to you all the time is the name that a particular record has in Ireland, you'll hear us talk about sources like the Protestant Householders of 1740 or the Ulster Muster Roll, and you may think, well... I don't think I would find my ancestor in that. You know, dissenter petitions, well, I wouldn't find my Episcopal ancestor in that. You just don't know. So you should always check every source, irrespective of the religion of your ancestor. You just never know. Another example here, we have a William Stokesbury. And with a name like that, he's clearly an Englishman. And he actually is listed in this uh, muster roll, but he is actually suspected of being involved in the rising. He is a... Uh, uh, was found in the company of a Michael Dunn, who was one of the leaders of the Rising of 1640 at this time, um, and it's thought to be an English recusant Catholic. This book is so valuable because not only do you have the muster roll itself, the names, but the gentleman who helped finish it, Robert Hunter died, and John Johnson then finished this work, and his notes, really detailed notes, help explain more about the individual listed. He has drawn information from that 1622 commission or from the depositions that I'm going to mention in just a minute and help to build up a picture of the individual. So we only know this about William Stotesbury because John Johnson has gone to the trouble to find this out from, for example, the depositions taken in 1653. So it's a wonderful resource where you may find more information about your ancestors than you might think. Often when you're looking at sources, you're sort of looking for the sort of very basic sort of low level stuff. But sometimes if you raise your sights, you might find detail there. For example, the state papers on Ireland are the documents that historians would use to write high blown history about the kings of Ireland, King England and, uh, you know, their affairs in Ireland. Uh, these state papers are digitized and available on this website. Now, this is not a website for ordinary punters, ordinary individuals to buy a log and it's for big institutions so we would use this at the public record office in Prony. and on that state paper online website we actually found two lists of inhabitants for the village as it would have been then of Antrim within County Antrim in 1638 at Easter time see the listing of these individuals here so sometimes you may find a useful genealogical source from a quite surprising uh, repository. You may not think to find a listing of ordinary individuals in a source like the state papers, but nonetheless, there we did. 
moving on to those depositions of 1640, these are witness statements that cover right away across the decade of the 1640s, a whole decade of war for the uh, rising eruption in October 1641, and it goes all the way through to the late 1640s when Cromwell comes and puts the war to an end, uh, brings it successfully to a conclusion for the English, and then there's massive reorganization and regranting of lands. These witness statements were gathered quite early on from about 1641 onwards, so right from the start, of individuals who had suffered loss. So they're primarily, but not exclusively, statements by the planters, the English and Scots, who have maybe been attacked, their wife maybe killed or murdered, raped, property stolen. There's loads of terrible examples of atrocities committed. But sometimes they also then will have witness statements from the native Irish of people who have suffered reprisals. So the planter community have attacked the natives in reprisals for something that happened. So it's pretty grim reading sometimes, but it's extremely useful genealogical information covering basically that decade. Here's an example here in 1653. So a statement taken 12 years after the fact, I don't know how reliable that would be, but nonetheless, here it is. Uh, so it was Thomas Smith, and he said that he lived at Lisanne in County Tyrone at the time that Andrew Young was murdered. He was one of the innkeepers, and the common report was that he was killed by James MacGyver. So James MacGyver is the native Irishman. Andrew Young, probably a Scot, has been murdered by MacGyver, and that's usually the nature of them. These depositions are held by Trinity College Dublin, and they have digitized this resort. It's been online now for a good 10-year period. Wonderful source to use for free. You can search by name, but also by county and free text. And as well as getting a transcript of the record, you can actually see a facsimile reproduction of the original. So if you've never used the depositions before, you should have a, a little plunder at them. And as well as the website, the Irish Manuscripts Commission have been publishing them uh, in a series of volumes in recent years. So you can access them that way. The earliest depositions make interest in reading because they often can uh, relate to people from the, pardon me, the southern counties of Ulster, like Cavan and Monaghan, where the people there fled very quickly to cities like Dublin for safety. And so some of the earlier depositions are from counties in southern Ulster. There are depositions from other parts of Ireland because, of course, the war spread across the whole island, so it's not exclusive to Ulster. In the northern counties, a lot of the Scots actually just went back home to Scotland to avoid uh, being attacked uh, or retreated to strongholds like Coleraine or maybe Derry City, for example. So they're very interesting in depicting this period, but they can also be really useful when you use them with a resource like the muster roll of 1622 or 1630. Um, and I want to just show you this example of how useful it can be. We've got two entries here, David Spear and John Smith, number 86 and number 100. We have no way of knowing at all that those two gentlemen were related in some way. But thanks to John Johnson, who's done the homework for us, we see in footnote 99 that David Spear is the brother of Janet Spear, who is the wife of John Smith. And we know that Janet Spear was killed in 1641 and that was brought up in a deposition dated 1653 concerning Alice Dowager of Antrim. So that would be relation of Randall MacDonald that I mentioned there, because, as he said, was a devout Catholic. And the Antrim, the Earls of Antrim, the MacDonalds were on the wrong side of the fight in the war in the 1640s. We also know in uh, footnote 100 that uh, John is husband to Janet Spear and brother-in-law to David Spear. So now, thanks to the work, we do know that Spear and Smith are related through marriage and Janet is the common link here. But poor Janet has been murdered. And we can find detail about Janet's murder in this deposition relating to Alice Dowager of Antrim. And here is a transcript of it. I'll not read it all out because it goes into a lot of detail. But basically, Alice is in the dock for not protecting Janet. So she said, um, whether the said Janet did not come into the castle and pray her ladyship to save her life. And it goes on and tells more about it. And then it goes down there and says that, um, that she does not know that the said Janet ever came into the house or that she ever spoke unto her or took her by the skirt or gave any command concerning her. But she said that long after she was murdered, she heard of it. And that she, that's Janet, was killed behind her own stable by whom she knows not. So thanks to the work of these academics, they have pieced together this family. Janet's unfortunate uh, story ends in a rather grim way. But interestingly, the both of these individuals uh, in their 
have a, or the other individuals have an afterlife because we see in the Castle Stewart papers, so these are the estate records, and this is correspondence in the estate records, that the individual has now said, I have now with trouble, difficulty and considerable charge procure the King's letter, i.e. pardon for restoring the old Countess Dowager of Antrim to her jointure, which I let her, I think, is full, but if anything yet be wanting, I will perfect it. So she was under the suspicion of being treasonous, had been on the rebel side, but now she's been restored to her living. But also within that same body of records, we see these spears, this time in Ballon Club in Scotland. We've got a John Spear, who would be a relation of David Spear mentioned there, that these spears are involved in collecting, I think it possibly, uh, oh, sorry, it's grand jury. So they're working for the grand jury in Ballonclug in the middle of the 17th century. So the spears show up in this resource as well. So you can see how you're able to sometimes join these documents together to build up a picture of the family. But many of the soldiers who came to Ireland for Cromwell were uh, English adventurers. They promised was they would get land, not money. So if the war was won, and indeed many of them were granted lands, for example, in County Tipperary. And that is detailed in this book here, Cromwellian Settlement in Ireland. Notice it's published in 1870, 52 years before the Four Courts Fire. So this book is drawing on information that was subsequently burned. We have a listing of 45 pages of adventures, nearly 1,400 names of English soldiers are listed in this book. And it comes from wonderful maps, as you can see here. These are the areas in County Tipperary where these soldiers were granted lands. And those parts of Tipperary to this day have a fairly strong Protestant character to them, reflecting the settlement of English Protestant soldiers back in the middle of the 1600s. And they also detailed uh, the lands west of the Shannon where the Irish were to be planted, the transplantation of the Irish when Cromwell said he would send them to Hell or Connacht. And you get in this book as well some of those transplantation certificates for what would be Gaelic Irish or Old English who are all Catholic and they're being forced to move west of the Shannon. This is an interest. There's not a lot of these, but this is quite interesting. Richard Christmas, which is a name to remember. He's a merchant from Bristol and he is making an appeal on behalf of Edward Brown, an Irish papist who actually looked after the affairs for uh, Christmas in the uh, Waterford area, so that's the southeast corner, and he is making a plea that Brown was a loyal subject and should not be forced to transplant as a result. There's also from uh, around about this period another list of proposed transplantation, this time concerning Scots, dating from 1653, published in this book, Historical Notices of Old Belfast, and available for free on archive.org. So you can see in a, quite a lot of cases we are talking about this morning that Rather than these sources, even though it's 17th century, being very inaccessible, a lot of the material is already published in old books that are now online for free. So a lot of this detail you can access yourself. You could go home today and start scrolling through this type of stuff. The Scots were long, Presbyterians, of course, were suspected by the government. You would think the Puritans and the Presbyterians would be natural bed, bedfellows, but they weren't. Uh, many Ulster Presbyterians were angry that Charles I had been beheaded. beheaded. In fact, they uh, besieged Derry City in protest, which is possibly one of the reasons why this list of Scots is being drawn up. Now, they'd never followed through on this, but because the authorities were concerned about the reliability of Presbyterians from Scotland, uh, that they considered actually moving them from the areas that they had settled. So this is a list of Scots to be transplanted out of the counties of Antrim and Down, given the locations in County Antrim and Down, where these Scots live. Now, further down the country in the county of Dublin, this is County Dublin, not the city of Dublin, we have an interesting list of inhabitants in a couple of baronies for uh, this period in time, the early 1650s. What is remarkable about this is the detail that is contained on these individuals. You can see they're organized by the head of the household, so usually husband wife and children or other individuals and it gives a physical description of these people so you can see they're edward burton age 16 years and thereabouts a little short youth speckled face black hair how remarkable is that that you've got a detailed uh, description of what the person looks like as well as their name and these as you saw they were published um by the Irish genealogists some years ago in two of their volumes so they would be accessible there but there's actually a transcript of this um in the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland. And that is an interesting point we would make. There you have a source concerning individuals in Dublin. 
but it, a copy of it is actually in the public record office in Belfast. So don't have this idea in your mind that, all right, I'm researching Northern ancestors from Ulster. I'll only find detail in Belfast. No, you may well find detail in Dublin, in the National Library or the National Archives. And similarly, you may be researching Southern ancestors and think, oh, right, I will only look at National Archives and National Library. Well, that would be short-sighted because you can, as we demonstrate here, you can find material in Belfast that may relate to a county in what is now the Republic of Ireland. So just be mindful of the possibilities for research in the different archives in our two main cities on the island. And what I was going to say there is when you look at the, some of the detail in that transcript, you see, although the, the listings themselves are short, there's a remarkable amount of detail on the individual themselves. And in some cases, the family, you know, the head of household, uh, may have been a principal tenant, and there's lots of information about people he's actually directly related to, or people who are maybe his under tenants. See, for example, Patrick Breartrand's tenants and followers listed here. So, for some people at least, that would be a really useful source. Also, from this period is a really unusual source, just to draw to your attention and draw to your attention this really valuable journal, The Irish Ancestor. It was published between about 1969 and about 1985. And like the Irish genealogist, you find lots of wonderful uh, short articles publishing source material drawn from really unusual sources. Now, a lot of it is very bitty and fragmentary and may not be in a database uh, like say Ancestry of My Past, simply because it's such a small little listing, but they're extremely interesting and could be useful to you. This is a listing of businessmen who issued tokens in Ireland. This is just after the war. Uh, and so small coin coppers are in small, short supply. So businessmen are allowed to issue their own tokens instead of small coinage. And this listing is individuals across the country, mostly Dublin and Cork, some in Belfast, uh, but there are others listed. You see Letterkenny, Sligo, Drogheda, Westmeath, and so on there. And what is quite interesting, they list for the individual <coughs> what they had as by way as a motif or a symbol on their uh, token. So Henry Cooker in Drogheda, he had it inscribed with for necessary change, a little pun there. Somebody up there had a female bust, somebody had eight diamonds. Somebody at a castle. John Gerald had heraldic arms. He was in the Alden Court. I wonder, are those his actual heraldic arms? And one could check, because you could check with the genealogical office in Dublin. We have Richard Hamilton here in John uh, Mill and Tipperary, Stag from Madrid. And this lad from Francis Harvey, quite funny, uh, it is inscribed with the words, When you please, I'll change these. So a little, again, a little pun. So rather unusual source from the middle of the 17th century. Now, by far, the most important sources that we have for 17th century research do date from the middle of the century. And we'll just finish with these now uh, and then go to Q&A. So, but now they're just less than 10 minutes to talk about some of this material. We have, as a result of Cromwell's invasion and confiscations, massive transfer of land. So you get land taken off the native Irish of the old English and given to these new planters, like these English soldiers we saw in Tipperary. So it's massive redistribution. So we have two surveys from the 1650s, the civil survey and the down survey. Now the civil survey was not a proper survey with a theodolite and chain. It was actually a inspection of records available at the time to identify who held the land in 1640 before the native rising erupted and who now held the land in the early 1650s. The government wanted to get a fix on who is the rightful landowner so they can charge them taxation and so on. Um, and so it documents those who had the land, those who now have the land. That's what makes it useful. Of course, the originals were burned, so it does not survive for the whole island. It's very strong for Munster and for West Ulster, not bad for Leinster, but you can see very poor, nothing at all for Connacht. And then we also have the books of survey and distribution, which take that land holding from the middle of the century and they map it out down to the end of the 17th century using various sources. So they're called the books of survey and distribution, also published as is the civil survey by the Irish Manuscripts Commission. You can see very strong coverage for uh, Munster and Leinster, a little bit for Connacht, and pretty good coverage for Ulster. Now, these 
books of survey and distribution and the civil survey published by IMC. They're long out of print, but you'll be pleased to hear that IMC have created a digital edition section to their website where they've made these old out of print books available for free. So you used to use a screen reader to view them, but more recently they have turned them into downloadable PDFs. So there's so many of these sources you can just access directly yourself. The civil survey, just to give you an example of it here, was the parish of Raffoe in Donegal. Look at these names, John's, John Fulton, British Protestant, John Smith, Kerr, Kyle, McNair, Buchanan, Leslie, Glass, Brown, Dick, Rankin and Walker, all described as British Protestant, but of course are all Scots. Those are all Scottish names, so just mindful of that. So these are people who have been granted these lands as a result of the Cromwellian confiscations. If we look at this, this is, I think, County Clare. Uh, no, sorry, this is Donegal as well, uh, Barry of Kilmacrenan. A barony of Kilmacrenan. Uh, note this time we have the people who have forfeited the lands. They have lost lands. Mary Nee Swin, relic of Walter McSwin, Irish Papist, Donald Og MacDonald, Irish Papist. All these are native Irish who have lost lands as a result of the rising and the war. So we've got detail on native landholders and on Scottish and English new settlers in a source like this. Almost at the same period of time, is the Down Survey. Now, the Down Survey was a proper survey. That's where its name comes from. They laid a chain down. That's why it's called the Down Survey. So they did survey the lands that had been confiscated and re-granted. And so we have these wonderful maps and these Down Surveys, which also, as you can see there, are available online and they're available at another mini website from the Trinity College Dublin, downsurvey.tcd.ie. So there again, we have, as well as the very interesting maps, we can see who is holding the land in this part of, in this case, County Carlow, the Barony of St Mullen, the Parish of St Mullen, and mostly is land now held by Gerald Kavanagh. He's the principal landowner in that part of the world. And we have as well as those two sources, those books of survey and distribution are available on the IMC website. So you can see there's a lot of material here from the middle of the century concerning landholding, that is available for free online. <laughs> now, I do accept that a lot of it is land holding, and maybe we, we may not find references to our tenant ancestors. Nonetheless, we can use a source like this, the Census of Ireland of 1659. It's not a real census. It's just the name uh, used for it. We can use this as a signposting exercise because this too is concerned with land holding. It's got to be compiled from whole tax returns, they were destroyed in the Fort of Clark. And it lists those with titles to land with the titulado names uh, here. We've got Parish, Townlands, then the names of the landholders, Barclay, Cunningham, Crawford, Hamilton. These are all Scots in County Down leasing land. But within this book, we will find at the end of a section, it will give you, as well as the landholder, it will say principal Irish names and some Scotch and their number. Now, this is County Antrim, Glenarm and County Antrim, Agnew, Macaulay, McLeister, Boyd, McBritney, McCurry, Crawford. Nearly all of those names are Scottish names there. So it may not give you a link to a direct ancestor, but a source like this could possibly be a signpost. You could say, right, I do know that my McLeisters are in Glenarm in 1659, thanks to this source. So it is worth consulting, even if you think, well, my ancestors didn't own a lot of land. And regrettably, this would have been, <laughs> there would have been the most useful source for this middle period. Regrettably, most of the records were burned. And hearth tax, it's a taxation on fireplaces in the home. Hearth tax was collected into the 18th century in Ireland. Uh, but really, we only have fragments of survived for the 17th century, for the 1660s. Nonetheless, we have, as you can see, good coverage for Ulster. There's no, no hearth money returned for Down, but there is for every other Ulster county. Not bad coverage for Leinster, a little bit for Munster, and only one for Sligo in Connacht. So that is a really useful source because everybody, apart from poor widows and basically the begging poor, were included in that source. So it's all level of society. And as well as that, a couple of the counties, I think Tyrone and Tipperary, have maybe two hearth money returns. So one from the early years of the 1660s and one for a later. And where you've got a later one, there often are far more names in a later hearth return than earlier in the decade because the government clamped down 
on tax avoidance. So that's useful because it covers all levels of society. Everybody, Catholic, Protestant, Irish, planter, they will be listed in that. And another source is the subsidy rule, also in the 1660s, less useful, less of it has survived as well, because it is a form of direct taxation paid to the king directly. So it's more the wealthy in society, less useful than the hearth rules. But the hearth rules and the subsidy rules, they too are easily accessible in many cases now, where they have been originally published maybe in an old journal, for example, in the journal of the Armagh Diocesan Historical Society, as we're looking at here, uh, but now available on websites like JSTOR. So that hearth money roll for Armagh in uh, 1660, now on JSTOR. Or here's hearth money rolls for County Kilkenny on uh, the Roots Ireland website that Gillian talked to you about. Or the subsidy roll for County Waterford, just one of a number of them, available from the Analecta Hibernica Journal from 1982, but now available on JSTOR. So you can see, while there's a lot of loss in the 17th century in terms of our records, um, the fragments that do survive often have already been published and now are available in digitized form online. So you, there's really quite a lot you can do for research. And don't forget as well, Gillian, I don't know if you would like to join. Now we'll go straight into the Q&A. Don't forget there are, and Gillian talked about church records, there are some church records available for the 17th century. So don't forget to overlook them. There's a small number of records for the, con uh, the congregation of the church, uh, the Presbyterian church, mainly late 1600s. There are some, of course, for the Church of Ireland, the Episcopal Church that Gillian already mentioned. And there are a very few in places like Wexford uh, for the Catholic Church in the 1670s, just a small number of years there. So don't forget, there are some church records available for the 17th century. Uh, and they may be another useful source. And finally, before she steps to the mic, don't forget old gravestone inscriptions, tombstone inscriptions, either from the 1600s or the early 1700s, which hark back to the 1600s, because some of our old headstones can be the earliest record you can find in Ireland, given information on your ancestor. So do not overlook old headstone inscriptions as well. Right, we'll stop there. Um, we have about 20 minutes left. So if you have any questions, I don't know, Scott, if you'll be doing any questions from people on Zoom or not, but we'll take we'll take some from the floor first if anybody. We just need to repeat. Yeah. Uh, if you could just call out this gentleman. Um, the question, just for the benefit of the viewers at home, are there any records of immigration? Regrettably, there are not records of immigration in the early period. Uh, before your independence, so up until, you know, 1776, uh, Anybody leaving Ireland, England, Scotland, Wales to come over to seize the America, they're they're going overseas, but they're not leaving British territory. You know, these are the British colonies in America. So they didn't need paperwork to go. So there was no requirement to record shipping details, shipping lists in the 18th century on immigrants coming out of Ireland. So if you take a Scots-Irish immigrant settling in, say, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, his paper trail for the 1740s, for the sake of argument, is a lot different from maybe the German he's living beside there who may have needed some paperwork when coming into America. They weren't required in the 18th century, so you won't get passenger lists. Your government did not require passenger lists to be kept until 1820. And we did not have records of outward migration from Britain and Ireland until 1890. Now, those 1890 stuff onwards is on the... Find my past website. That stuff is held in queue in London. Your stuff in America here, 1820, that's in your national archives and on places like uh, Family Search and Ancestry. Regrettably, there's really nothing in Ireland that's unique. Anything we have to do with passenger lists really are just copies of records held here. Remember, a ship's manifest, if it survives at all, will go with the ship. So it will leave the port of embarkation and will be deposited most likely here in the port of arrival in a customs house or a court office here in America, not left behind in Ireland. So regrettably, there's very little and it's nearly all for the 19th century. It's quite bitty before the 1850 period. It gets better after the 1850 and it's nearly all here in America. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? This? Yes, sir. Website that you recommend, not only uh, 
uh, one of the senses uh, that my family arrived in 1839. So, uh, what strikes is that a lot of what we have gathered seems to be 1840s on. Mm -hmm. and I mean, but I need to get back to it. I would always recommend you start with the Roots Island site because it has church records back to the 1600s. So we'll go right up to the early 1900s. So regardless of the time period that you're researching, Roots Island is a really good one to search. If you find it on there or any of the other church record websites that I showed you, um, they're looking at some valuation records from the 19th century, like the tithe books and Griffiths valuation will at least show you the parishes where those surnames are found for you then to explore the records. So I would just check all those different websites in the 74 page document that was emailed out to you. Well, I saw that he had just a uh -huh. Uh-huh. So I'm assuming the last the surname Burns, I'm assuming they just they moved, they came to Scotland and moved to Ireland at some point. Maybe in the yeah. And then I guess you would have to start with where you left for. Mm -hmm. The gentleman's just asking what best website to use when they he knows that. His ancestor came to from Ireland in 1839. So you start with that. You start with looking at their ages when they died, working back, seeing roughly what year they're likely to have been born, and then looking for their baptismal records in Ireland. If they married in Ireland, they're looking for their marriage records. If they have children in Ireland, looking for their children's baptismal records. So that's the first thing to always look at. And there's also, I was just reinforced, Gillian mentioned the tithe books are 20, 1823 to 38. So it's right in the right in the sweet spot for you. Those early townland valuation records, that some of them are the late 1820s, but they're the 1830s as well. So they're on the National Arc. There's two things immediately you could look at as well as the, the records Gillian mentioned in Roots Ireland. Uh, also, the name Burn or Burns, remember that could be an Irish, maybe Scottish as in Robbie Burns, but it, especially if they're going from court. Oh, Burn, you know, if you look at the, the McLeish's surnames of Ireland, and remember a point we make again and again and again, is that um, you've got Scots Gaelic and you've got Irish, and they're basically the same. Four hundred years ago, they're pretty much the same language. They begin to part company, but you know, it's like um, Italian and Spanish. You know, an Italian and a Spaniard can speak to one another without talking each other's language. The Irish speaker and a Scots Gaelic speaker can do the same thing to a certain degree. So a lot of your surnames in Ireland may be of an Irish origin, but it could be a Scot. So a name like the President Kennedy. You know, that name could be Southern Irish, it could be Northern Irish in origin, and it could be Scottish in origin, all coming from the Gaelic very version of the name. So your Burns could be Scottish, wouldn't knock that out at all, but could also be from the Gaelic O'Burn. There's also a thing to bear in mind. Yes. Okay. Uh, Scott, I think you were you going to have a question, then we'll do the lady in the black jumper. Do <laughs> you know any websites that have any of the records going through and what are the Yes, so that map that I sh the um so the question is, are there any websites that show surnames and where they are most common in Ireland? So I would recommend that website I showed in my introductory session, which is johngranham.com. Um, and he has mapped surnames. Now his website allows for gentle browsing. So you can look at a few pages, a few different surnames, and then a little paywall will come up. But that's the best website for that kind of project. However, any of the free websites that we have shown you today can be used for that surname work, putting in a surname and getting a sense of where the results are. Okay. Well, that's it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so any of those free uh, website resources can be used to, to, to do that work with surnames, putting it into Griffiths valuation or putting it into the 191 census or, or um, the civil registration and Irish genealogy. Um, and the, you can do the work that way. But John's actually done the mapping work. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly those free resources, you could do the work yourself. Well, you, I don't know. We've lost the internet. Sorry, I don't know. It must have. Uh, like, yeah, it seems to. It cuts in and out. Cut. We, lost it. we were going to just. So the, just to reinforce what Gillian said, they asked about Ireland site, the genealogy website from the National Archives, because it has so many. It's got the census, 1901, 1911, the fragments. 
It's got the tithe books. It's got those valuation records mentioned to the gentleman. Um, Public Record Office of Northern Ireland's uh, various websites, including the one, if you look for name search, it's got fragments from the 18th century. It's got dissenter petitions from 1775, the flax growers list of 1796, the Protestant householders of 1740, and the religious census of 1766, plus fragments of prerogative wills and consistorial or diocesan wills prior to 1858. So all those could be used as signposting exercises for your names. And I mentioned there as well, just in that last presentation, um, you know, those hearth money rules or the Pender census of 1659, almost anything now can be used as a signpost to say, right, where is my surname? And they really do work. Like one of the most common ones in the old days was, you remember, Matheson's surname report from about 1891. And that's based on actual birth. Matheson was the general registrar of birth, deaths and marriages. And that source is based on actual births. So it's real data it's drawn from. And that is a really useful guide. Um, like my Gillian gave that example. She, she used Sugru and Murphy. Well, my name Mullen is a bit like Murphy. It's a very common name. It's one of the 20 most common names in Ireland. But my mother's maiden name is Moreland. Moreland uh, found in only a few locations in places like County Down. And if I used some of those signposts for Merlin, they will point me to the places where my mother's family come. It does work. It really does work for less common names. So use all the digitized sources we've talked about as signposting. The lady in the black jumper. <laughs> <laughs> what was it anyway, just so we know? <laughs> okay, any other questions in the room or on the Zoom? No, exhausted, all done. <laughs> well, if you were, we're, we're going to be packing up as we finish here. So if you have a question you just wanted to ask one on one because it's of a, you know, a, a specific nature, that's, you know, more than welcome to join us at the table. This lady, were you going to venture one? Yes, there's an electronic handout, and if you haven't received this, you can take There's also the electronic, uh, there's a large 72-page document, and then there's a number of other links. So there's a, actually a raft of material that has been sent on to you. Okay, gentlemen here? That's correct, yes. yes. Okay. And one other point, just to say in finishing, uh, is that although... American genealogists may be used to using the like of Find My Past and Ancestry for their research. They think they're the go-to places for their, their Irish research. They're not. The go-to places for Irish research are the actual archives themselves. That's what we've been showing you here. Uh, the National Archives of Ireland, the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland, the National Library of Ireland. These sources are free to use on their websites. There's no login. There's no nothing. You don't need any third party to take you there. Just go directly. That's where you should use for when you're starting your research. That's where all the principal and most useful sources for your Irish research when you start are to be found. And of course, the other major one, as Gillian has, you know, has told you, is Roots Ireland. Now that is a law, you do need a login for Roots Ireland, but there's over 20 million records of births, baptisms, marriages, and burials, stroke deaths, and gravestone inscriptions on that's website. So those are the ones to go to because that's where you will make the most progress rather than trying to find. And a lot of cases find my past and ancestry or family search are just second handing you information that's in the public record office or, or the National Archives Ireland anyway. So just go there, you know. Yeah. Yes. I will Yes, you're quite you're quite right. Uh, you know, archives and libraries and other research organizations, genealogical societies, historical societies, make sure you just avail of all of those um, and tap into all the amazing resources and the amazing advice and knowledge that the staff in there have. And um, one other thing to finish off, one of the attendees mentioned to me that on PBS tonight, there's going to be a documentary or a program on the Great Famine. So if you're having a whole Irish day, you might want to catch that tonight. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I think that's it. Right. Any anything last before we finish up? Okay. okay. Well, thanks everybody for coming.